Good morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome, everyone, to the Mills Fabrica and the launch of Denim Futures, our latest campaign and exhibition. For those of you who are here for the first time, my name is Amy. I head up the Mills Fabrica here in the UK. And to sum us up in one sentence or two, the Mills Fabrica is fostering an ecosystem of innovators within the textile and agri-food industries. And we do this through investment, partnerships, and supporting and showcasing the groundbreaking innovations that we believe have the potential to change the world. I think everyone in this room can agree that denim is iconic. It's transcended decades, evolving to reflect the changing attitudes and circumstances of every era. And today we'll be hearing from the visionaries and the change makers who are shaping the future of denim. So to kick us off, I'd like to introduce Mohsin Sajid, also known as the Denim King, <laughs> to walk us through the history of denim. And the clicker. Okay. Hi, hi everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Morsi and I'm a denim designer. This is work. And yeah, um, I normally do presentations that are like three to four hours long. So having 20 minutes, it's going to be uh, quite, quite interesting. So let's go. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's me. Uh, I've a consultancy together with my wife. We've been, we've, been, we've been like designers for like 20 years. I also teach and yeah, I teach at LCF, St. St. Martins and many, many colleges around, around the world. Um, extremely, extremely fun, especially like teaching the younger, like, the younger like, generation and still having a foot still in, still in that industry. It's quite, quite, quite important. Um, so yeah, denim, li denim uh, literally is a like sort of a riveting story. We can't really begin without saying it, that that it pretty much starts here. But workwear in like general, we've been having workwear and like protection garments for like so for, uh, for like sort of millennia. So these sort of like protection garments have been around. But this our story here begins here with the actual actual, actual sort of like rivet. And it's these two chaps here that are most important. Um, Levi Strauss and Jacob, Jacob Davis. Many people don't know who Jacob Dave, Davis is, but he's the actual chap that came up with the actual like, rivet. So he was a humble tailor and he, he had a really great, great idea and he went, to his fabric, he went to his fabric supplier, which was Levi Strauss, who was actually a, like, a sort of like, dry goods like, salesman. And they, uh, poor, old, poor, poor old Jacob Davis didn't have enough money for the patents, but Le, uh, Levi Strauss helped him with the actual like, patent of it as well, which is quite really cool. So that's how the story actually like, begins. And Oh, so li li the great thing is because it's uh, because it's every single like rivet has actually got a patent num number on it. So we actually know quite a lot of information about it because we can actually see the record, the actual actual actual, actual sort of record, uh, uh, records about it. So it's really quite fun. But this is the, this is the actual like patent here and the original original garment. It probably well, it most it most likely was a duck canvas, but they actually had a blue uh, indigo cloth as well, roughly at the same time. That's why on the very first leather patch, it clearly says pa patented ri sort of, uh, patented duck and denim like clothing. So they both were at the same time, but we we believe we believe currently it was actually a duck can duck, duck canvas first. So if anyone says blue jeans, blue jeans, most likely it was a white duck sort of canvas. Most most likely also a like brown. So that's where we really 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 start. And the whole thing about sell selvage, the whole thing about selvage as well. There's a whole like there's a whole like love affair about it, and I lo so I love it as well. But if you spoke to me maybe f 15 years ago, I'd say I only I only wear selvage. But now that philosophy of mine has completely changed to a point where it's not actually that important. It's more about the fibres and how we make the garments and how we and how we treat our workers. So even though it's a beautiful even though it's a beautiful thing, and what's great is like Cone Denim, our friends at Cone, they were the ones that came up with the actual red line like selvage so if anyone has like sort of any sort of red line it's actually because of this one mill that how they sort of identified which fabric was was for which company they put different colors through the actual like selvage but red became famous because that that uh, red was the color that they used for like levi's so that's that's what we know and the early early sort of like selvages had no color at all but they started using colors from 1927 so anyway, the little little bit little bit of history so the earliest garment that we know was a duck, duck canvas and this was the anniversary year of the actual patent so levi's actually sort of like recreated the most uh, up to date version of their uh, 1873 pants so this 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 is the version i managed to snag like th 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 this one but the blue one I couldn't, so I was a bit, bit like gutted about it. 
And then, yeah, so if you ever happen to find any of these historical garments, oh my God, they go for tens to hundreds of thousands of like dollars now. There was an auction only last week where a similar pant to this went for like a hundred and five or, or, or hundred and seven thousand dollars. So it's quite important, but very, very rare. And when you do find them, they're extremely like delicate because these, these fabrics, they weren't as strong, as sturdy as what, what we now use. They were like, a, like, like two by one, a very lightweight quality. That's why early, early, early pieces are never really found in their pure raw state. They, they've been worn in. And these early pieces were also overalls. They weren't jeans yet. O the overalls were like, sort of like protection garments that you put onto another, sort of, you know, another garment. That's why these early styles weren't slim. They were meant for like protection. There, there you go. So yeah, they were made for like miners. That's that's what they were made for. They weren't fashion garments yet. So that doesn't happen for a, a, li a li little while more. But basically, this interesting period between 1873 to 1890 is the period that I really love because that's actually the that's actually the period where the rivet was in was actually in that patent. So many other companies weren't allowed to do like rivets. So lots more ingenious ways of of like construction, pocket shapes, you name it, happened in this period. E even though we associate it with like Levi's, there were literally dozens and dozens of companies making like sort of workwear and like protection garments that are equally as as sort of like. Uh, Exciting, and I'm like a I'm like a Levi's man, and I'm actually I'm I'm actually saying it. There are so many amazing like sort of details between 1873 and 1890 that hasn't really been like documented properly. So it's really quite interesting. So yeah, so you can find garments still. There, there's a crazy guy called Michael Michael Allen Harrison, Brit Eaton, that go down mines and do crazy stuff where they find the actual jeans. And I, I would love to do it, but I think my wife would probably get really scared because I probably wouldn't wouldn't be able to come out of it because I'm quite claustrophobic. So I don't know if it's going to manage it. But if you ever find a piece like this, a hundred grand straight away. Really cool. So yeah, so after the whole. So like sort of like Levi's and many other companies were making denim garments and then you get to the period where the gold and silver rush period slows down. So the first early adopters of, of these garments were the, were the cowboys and like the, and like the railroad workers. Basically, these garments were still workwear. They weren't considered fashion garments yet. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be going down, um, you wouldn't be wearing it on Sunday. You'd only be wearing denim if you're doing something with manual labor and, and you're working. That's the important thing here. So the early, early adopters were these sort of guys and that's what these denim companies all pivoted towards is to market themselves as, as strong garments for uh, workwear and doing like manual and doing like man, manual labor farm for farm work uh, you name it so yeah then we get the magical period you know i stole this line from minus cowboys film art and music literally from the 40s and, and like 50s period a lot changed we have the we have the two world wars have just happened so ha, ha, happened as well the whole americana freedom the whole like, that all happened we because us in the west we our the american dream got exported round round the world all of the army guys are wearing denim everyone wanted to wear denim it was a sign of being like being like rebellious and li li literally the younger generation were, were like adopting it, and these early Hollywood icons were, were actually wearing wearing like denim as well. And there's a really funny story about Bing Bing Cosby. He went into a hotel suite in in um, 1953, and he actually got thrown out because he was wearing like denim. So there's a whole generation thing ha ha happening here, where the younger generation are wearing denim, and the old older generation think of it still as, as like a work a like workwear garment. And lots of influential films as well in this period that helped that sort of like narrative come on. And you can see. Literally within literally about 10, 15 year period, denim became wide, widespread and a lot more people started making the fabric as well. Then you get the whole summer of love period, which is kind of like the period that we're in now. It's all about self-expression. It's all about individuality. It's, we're gone full circle again a few times since then. But if you ever come across any of these garments from this period, they're very, very special because the fabrics themselves are still ring ring and amazing and it's all amazing. But yeah. Quite, quite lovely. And then the whole design of denim period happened in like the 70s and 80s. And this is where things change quite a lot, where we get, we got the introduction of open end yarns and we get the introduction of doing fast and cheaper, cheaper, cheaper production. That's why denim in this period, it looks like a certain way. I'm not saying it's bad yet, but it's definitely gone down, gone, gone like down a notch. But it was, they, they were trying to like perfect it and they were trying to make denim better by get, getting rid of all of the imperfections and like problems from the past. But that caused many more things later down, down the road. But now we're in the denim renaissance period that I say where we know about the past, we know about how we used to make fabrics, and now we're, now we're using future fibers to do it, and it's very, very exciting. So yeah, that's the period that we're in now. So this is quite an important slide. Many of you, may, many of you do know, but you know, just so you, just we're all on the same page, two different types of yarns, ring spun and open end. 
everything back in the day before 1970 was Ring. Now we've got a mixture of both. And there's, a, there's, a, there's like a few others. The important thing here is Ring spun stronger because the fibers go up the, up the, up the, up the fiber and open end, they twist, twist round. Any of you ladies with long hair and you pull your hair, it's quite strong. When you, when you twist it, it snaps. Same thing. So that's why denim in the 70s and 80s became a lot more weaker because they opted to open, open end yarns. And another fun thing here, a little chart here if, you exp if I'm explaining it. It's cheaper to make an open end factory than a ring spun sort of like factory. That's why all the, all the mills in the 70s and 80s that popped up mostly were open end. So yeah, it's quite a little, a little fun thing here. And a lot of work that I do is I do a lot of denim um, cotton concepts where we, I research different types of cottons from the, from the past. This particular gene, even though it's a really old gene from uh, 80, 80, 90, very difficult to, re, to actually recreate it. Yes, you can pattern cut it and get some engineer to do the slub pattern, but very, very difficult. So different types of cottons, uh, you can see also it's very difficult to get to the old, old, older strain because cotton, just like our food, has been like, genetically like, modified quite quite like, considerably. Not so much a bad thing to get a better yield, to you know, all the rest of it, but the means that we, we get rid of older strains. You can still do it, but you have to convince a really big mill and gin to do it. So uh, cotton, where did it come from? So cotton obviously comes from a plant. This is actually a colored cotton um, film that me and my wife Sadia did. And cotton comes in many different colors and, and, and all, it's grown all around the world. And it's different, uh, different staple lengths. Even our American friends, they actually got their LS cotton and they merged it with Egyptian, co Egy Egyptian cotton to make a longer staple. So there's a lot of that kind of work going on. But some of the original co cottons were, were, were these natural, natural colors. Even the, even, even the very first gene could have been from a natural, a natural cotton, but it hasn't been proven yet. But yeah, I think it was. Um, and and like recycling, this is something that is heavily uh, uh, downstairs. It's been it's been talk, talk, talked about, but I honestly believe we don't need to grow anything anymore. We can just use like recycled fiber going forward. But the problem is, currently, whenever you uh, like recycle a garment. You, you can only recycle certain bits of the garment. Yes, there are machines that you can throw the whole gene in and it mashes it up and it gets rid of the, gets rid of the trims. But in the real world of speaking, there's always people literally by hand picking out the garments, fig, fig, uh, figuring out what's cotton, what, what isn't, cutting out the thread, because ev even the thread's got polyester in it. So when you, when you recycle anything, there is a bit of a process that goes through. So our job as designers is to make, is to make sure that the whole gene can be recycled and not, not, just, it, not just the big, big panels. Um, and then indigo, you know, the reason why genes fade is, is how, we, how, we actually, how we actually dye them in the ring, ring spinning like pro, sort of process. If you notice down there in the corner, the, the core of the yarn is still white because of how we dye our sort of yarns. And this was actually a process to speed up production and, 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 to, and, and, and to do it much more like, sort of like cheaper. So they dye the yarn and it comes out and they dye it again and it comes out and it dye it again it's so fast that only the outside gets like, coated. And our Japanese friends do it a lot more. We do it probably like seven or 10 times. Our, our Japanese friends do it up to like 20 times. So it depends how expensive you want to be and how deep the indigo is as well. Um, and then how, how, how fabrics are made. Yes, I, there's a love story with like selvage and it's, ma it's amazing. Not anymore. I'm not, I'm not, I don't give a two hoots about it too, too much. To me, it's more about, yes, the construction's in, important. There's always like a, a like sort of, sort of like historical like a reason for, like for sort of fabrics. And I like these earlier constructions that are a lot more like lightweight and looser weave like sort of like tensions. But, but also like remembering the past that it was a duck sort of canvas sort of at, at the beginning. But denim that we all wear today, like 95% of all, all denim, is a three by one right hand tool, which is the middle one right, right there. And there's a close up of it there. So for every three, it goes under one. And the reason they came up with this ingenious way of weaving fabric is like, how can we make a fabric that's all blue, but how can we do it in a cheap way? Let's just do it so most of the blue is on the outside. And then also this way, we don't dye our legs as much. As, so it's just a really clever evolutionary way of how we made fabrics. But the earliest f f sort of fabrics for these garments were a two by one, considered like a shirting weight now, but now it's like a like three by one. And yeah, it's quite a lot of, yeah. take, a, take a picture of, of, of the slide. It might, might, it might, it might be easy to, like, to, to actually like, sort of like rem remember. And then, the main weaves that we come across in the denim world are a left-hand twirl, right-hand twirl, broken twirl, which is the zigzag one. Um, basically, it's, the, it's basically all fabrics skew, if you, don't, if you don't know. They don't skew as much to, anymore, but the way they got, got around it, and our friends at, like Wrangler did it, is by doing left and right at the same time. So it shrinks at an e at, at a even rate. But nowadays, if you go to any denim fair, you're bombarded with the most craziest like, developments. So, uh, super exciting, but immensely scary as well. So um, it's quite fun being a denim designer, but that's like, you know, 
know, two, four, three or four percent of what's going on, but the main bulk of it of the business is going to be on the on on the left there. And then in, so Indigo, Indigo has got a very interesting um, past and future. So Indigo comes from a plant. This is Indigo from my garden. But this particular here, this is actually actually from um, from the Cone Denim archive. And actually, you know, they've actually got it's all Indigo um, cakes from 18, 18, really amazing archive actually. But there's evidence, and this Indigo it would have come from the Indus Valley region in modern day Pakistan. Even cotton was from that from that from that from that area so, uh, as well. So a lot of lot of lot of history. In that part of, of, of the India, which we should we should always be talking talking about and not really ignoring, but Indigo also has a like European sort of history, which many people don't really really like touch sort of of, 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 of touch on. Our friends at, at like Candiani did a lot of like a lot, lot of like a lot of like research r recently, and they figured out that the earliest sort of fabric was a, was a, was a tuber one from like, sort of from like Europe. It was they were using woad dye, not sort of indigo, and it was a mixture of hemp and like sort of like, sort of hemp and like linen. So very very beautiful. But the, the the clever thing here about these early early it's uh, European indigo garments, they had the Indigo was on the weft and the warp was white. So it's the complete opposite to how we make, fa make fabrics now. But very, very, very cool. And then the future of indigo. Now, downstairs, we've got our friends, uh, friends Hugh here. But the future of indigo is extremely exciting, where we're looking at, ba at, at, at bacteria based sort of indigos. We're looking at natural indigos that are done in a more cleaner way. And it's just very exciting. We don't need to use that, petro that or petrochemical stuff, really, to, to be honest. And this, this future, and also our friends at, like Ten uh, friends at Tencel, they, they came up with a mode out indigo where they inject the dope stage they put indigo in. So that way of making a fiber has no crocking. It's like 99% uh, water savings, heat, heat savings. OK, that, it might not fade it's sort of that, that well, but we're at the early stages of it. The, you know, the mills are only got to this fiber and only like a year ago. So it's very exciting, the space that we're, that, uh, <laughs> that we're in, because many, many people are experimenting with doing indigo in a much better better way. And then, you know, the earliest garments that we know, know about, at, 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 especially at, 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 at Levi's, were like natural sort of indigo. So, you know, they stopped using nat natural indigo about 1894. Cone denim say it's a bit, late, bit later, but that's when it came, in, came into force. But yeah, it's very difficult to tell because when you analyze it, indigo is still indigo. So it's very hard to actually, actually, actually see if it's the real, real stuff or not. But cer certain people can, can like, figure out. But, 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 uh, but for sure, they're like, sort of like, many of the genes in, in the archive before the 1894 period were natural indigo, which is quite fun. And then historical like, research. I do a lot of this kind of work where I come across scraps of pocket details and have an old patent drawing and I figure out how to make, make, make the garment in like a historical way. And it's a beautiful way to work because there's so many amazing stitches that we've forgotten about and shapes and it's, it's quite beautiful. So do, do, this kind of research I do a lot with my students as well. And then you know, what better than actually going to visit archives? I was very, I was very lucky to visit the, the like, Levi's archive and met Tracy Panic, who's a good friend, a friend, friend, good friend of mine. And this is actually a piece that a historian called Michael Allen Harris found in a pit. And it, there's, it's one of the only, well, one of the best examples of the 1874 or 1880 tr uh, triple pleated blouse. And I was extremely uh, lucky to examine the actual one uh, that's in the archive. It's just a very, it's very, very special piece. If you notice, even the twin needle stitching, it's like a, in between a one eighth and like sort of like three sixteenth. Minute like details, even the collar shapes, everything about it is so beautiful. We're down to the down to the pleats. These early styles were made by tailors. They weren't made by you know, marketing, marketing people yet. So they were beautifully like, sort of like constructed and all clean, like all, all like clean, like uh, 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 construction. So these early garments, there's a lot of people just like me who researched the past to understand it. And that's what we should be doing. And this, this is the exciting period I was telling you a bit about from 1873 to 1890, when, when the rivet was in force, many ingenious things were being invented. People were putting their pockets in a curved way, putting them un sort of underneath the, the uh, waistband, underneath the uh, yoke panel, it's, it's, uh, 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 underneath the cinch. It's really, really cool. So that's an old historical garment found, found down a mine. And this is the like, sort of recreation to understand it. A very exciting kind of work to do. And then you got to know your stitches. Like I'm, I'm a British-born like designer. I didn't know in, did, uh, 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 I didn't know inches. But basically, for me, you become a better designer the moment you realize everything's in like inches. Automatically, you're a better like designer. And if you understand it, it's like a light bulb moment. You go up to every garment, even sportswear garment. You're like, oh shit, that's a like three sixteenth. That's a uh, that's a quarter edge stitch. That's a that's a that's a, 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 a like triple needle like quarter stitch. It's, a, it's amazing when you when you when you like figure it out. But then when you look at these old historical garments, it all match all matches up. 
But when you look at any modern, modern day garments, they haven't got the 3 16th or the 1 8th. These are, these are types of stitchings that we no longer use anymore. But it's like a golden ratio. It's like when you visit a really beautiful build, building and it's constructed in a, in a beautiful way. These are old measurements that we no longer use. And we should start, start using them again because they're beautiful. Um, even the garments that I'm wearing today, I've made it with a, a like, 3 16 stitch. So it's quite important. And then there's, what are the solutions? You know, like, you know, a, garment, a, okay, a denim garment, you know, the whole story of denim started with, with, the actual, with, the, with the humble like, rivet. But now we've come to a point in our, our denim like, evolution where actually I don't think we should be using rivets at all. Like, completely, uh, completely crazy statement I'm saying, but it's very difficult to rip a rivet out or to cut it out in a, a like, recycling uh, center. You have moments, seconds to, to make a light, a light decision. Why not just do a circle bar tack like our friends at like Wrangler did? And why not use a cotton, friend, a, a cotton or tensile thread to do it? So there are solutions out there that people have already done. And this is one that I just literally stole from like, from like Wrangler. And I said, I'm going to do it. And I bought the actual machine that does that, uh, that circle stitch. Quite mental. I think I'm the only guy in like, the UK with it. But yeah, that's how much. Come, that, yeah, I've got more than like, sort of the 30 machines. But yeah, quite mental. And you've got to know your fibers. Oh, oh my god. It's not just cotton anymore. It's so exciting, the landscape of making fabric. Now, I spend half my time like, designing fabrics now. And I get quite excited mixing these things, things up and see what happens. Yes, there's a price issue for most of it, and hemp's very expensive at the moment, but cotton isn't, and like tensile's cheaper than cotton. All these things are gonna like fluctuate a lot, but we just need to stay and stand by our guns and develop fibers and fabrics that can be fully circular and, like, and like disappear. It's very important. We should not rely on polyester for its strength. We can mix a bit of hemp with it, mix a bit of marmara hemp with it, mix a bit of, you know, cottonized hemp, hemp with it, sure. But we need to really, really train every young designer to just not go to the obvious. <laughs> Honestly, we're, we're heading for a like, disaster. And, then, and for me, I do a lot of work where I'm doing a lot of experimentation when it comes to pattern cutting. I'm, I'm a trained f fashion designer. I'm not a marketing guy with money. I learned this thing. But now, I, I, because I know how to construct garments and make garments, the obvious solution to me was to try and construct garments in a, with a zero waste like philosophy. So this is me, I, I, I Cone Denim uh, hired me to make a series of garments, like six or seven like garments, and I did them all in, in, in with a like zero waste like sort of life sort of uh, uh, philosophy, and extremely, extremely fun. Even our friends in like the Netherlands, there's a, a college I work for called TU Delft, and they're doing jacquard weave like te te technology with like indigo. So these are garments that are fully constructed with only three sewing lines, and it's a, and all you do is like, a, it's kind of like an accordion, how you, how you make it. Very interesting space that we're, that we're in. And one of the last slides is, po is polyester. I, man, if there's one thing that we learned from today is polyester is the evilest thing ever. So this is something, this is a little funny little thing that I sort of, sort of made. Warning, this garment contains 100% 100, contains 100 po sort of polyester uh, uh, fiber, which is a, so, uh, a, a like derivative of crude oil, sheds microplastics when machine was harmful if swallowed. Should be in every single polyester garment. Should be. Is it though? I don't know. And then, yeah, that, that's me. So anyway, um, thank you. So yeah. Thank you so much, Morsin. <laughs> yeah, perfect, just on time. Um, so to design sustainably is an essential aspect of the industry's efforts to reduce its environmental footprint. So here to discuss, um, I'd like to introduce on stage Kelly Harrington, creative consultant, who will be our moderator, joined by panelists Jonathan Chang, aka Denim Jedi. And uh, he told me to put that. That's it, because I wanted you to say it out loud. <laughs> um, we have Anna Foster, founder and creative director of ELV Denim, and Alexandra Amata, designer at Amata Studio. So please come up on stage. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I can see some familiar faces in the audience um, and some new faces. So I'm going to quickly introduce myself. My name's Kelly Harrington, and I am a creative consultant. Um, I'd call myself a slashy because I do a number of different weird and wonderful things. Um, you might have seen me on Instagram, probably. <laughs> but here uh, I am going to introduce the lovely 
uh, team here, some special guests. I've got um, Jonathan, Anna, and Alex, or Alexandra. <laughs> um, and I'd like to start by, um, I'd like you to introduce yourselves and tell me how you got here, your experience, and your background, so everyone can get a gist. So should we start with you, Jonathan? All right. Um, I'm here because Amy invited me, basically. <laughs> um, I'm kind of jet lagged and incoherent straight off a plane. So uh, I just say like Google, you can Google me a bit. But why I, what I will say is, and we've barely met, is I've, your work, both of your works, I've seen on the boards of my design teams in the past. Uh, I've got to say I'm a fan myself. Um, um, Alessandra, I, I loved your final project, your, your, your work, and I think we have like Martin Gamper in common as well. And Anna, I've definitely had like probably your garments in, in Levi's design studio uh, looking at them. And Kelly, you're everywhere. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, Anna, do you want to introduce yourself? Well, I think uh, Jonathan's just teed me up quite nicely. <laughs> um, so I'm Anna, I'm the founder of VLB Denim. Um, I set up the brand five years ago. I was a stylist for 20 years and it was kind of trying to team, trying to find the perfect pair of jeans as, as a woman. I always found that I really wasn't spoken to when I was shopping. I would always go and try and million pairs of jeans on, never quite finding that fit. So I decided that I was going to do something that meant that the customer and the consumer and the woman or the man trying the jeans on were in control. So I wanted to use... Um, come up with a design which meant that it could kind of evolve with everybody, it could change, it could be adapted to a lifestyle, it could be modular, pieces could be changed, kind of with the idea that you have something and you keep it for life. Um, because that's really what a luxury brand is, you know, creating something for everybody that can last forever. Um, and then I decided that I couldn't abide seeing all, you know, I mean, I think Moshin put all those images of all those jeans out there. There is so much denim out there. and. As you, you know, and as you were saying, the quality is getting kind of worse and worse, unfortunately. So now let's revalue all the material that did cost the environment so much, you know, with all the water usage, we saw those dyes go in. So I take all the jeans, the, we hand curate all the material and make these amazing pieces that kind of really celebrate the processes that happened and give them a new life. So that's it. And over to you, Alex. Um, yeah, I'm Alexandra Armada. Um, I studied here at CSM and I finished my MA uh, just at the start of the pandemic, which was like the worst start to a career ever. Um, and so during the course of one of the lockdowns, I ordered a bunch of denim off of eBay and secondhand sites. And as, I, as everybody, I was locked in my house. So I decided, inspired as Jonathan said, by this project um, by Martino Gamper, 100 Chairs in 100 Days. I decided to make a pair of jeans every day for a month. So it was 30 jeans in 30 days over the lockdown. Um, and it, I don't recommend it. It was, I couldn't do 100, it would, it would be um, horrible. Um, and then after that, a year later, I kind of re revisited the same idea and did a project that then applied more time consuming techniques to denim and kind of inspired by couture, um, but then applying it to such a ubiquitous item was like a fun contrast that I wanted to explore. And today I just, I do some freelance work. I still upcycle. Um, I just released a collection that's inspired by my Eastern European heritage um, and the kind of contributions that Eastern <coughs> Europe made to denim design um, during the communist era. Amazing. Um, so I'm going to start with my first question. Um, I'm going to open it out to all of you. Um, why did you choose to explore denim and what made you fall in love with denim fabric? Who wants to go first? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, well, go yeah, um, I think I mentioned before, I think, and as we've learned the last, you know, 20 minutes from, I mean, it's so inspiring listening to all that history and like, you know, like a nanosecond that you gave, but denim was designed as a workwear fabric. It's designed to last. And I think we can talk about all the kind of future that we have to kind of think about what's happening in the future, but that quality that we had then has to happen now. Otherwise we're just creating more things that aren't designed to last. So denim is this incredibly resilient fabric and just isn't valued as much because people were churning things out so quickly you know, the idea of, you know, creating what, 15 million pairs in one year or something like that. And, and that does, you can't really create that many pairs of jeans in a year 
with the same kind of quality that you should that each pair should be made with so that's why I just wanted to use the denim and rework it so it has so much history it has so much life left into it but it's not loved because of its state or its condition or it's so you know by extracting as much as you can as much as possible from it we have you know we have very little waste that we use we make we've got this amazing new contraption so we're able to kind of cut out longer pieces and construct material and I think as much as we are designing denim for the future is in the material we also have to design ways of constructing material that already exists and then and celebrate it's all in its individuality because we're taking you know we're preparing things together it's such a beautiful experience when you get material and you think oh god it doesn't look great and then you see you know when it comes off you know we all handcraft everything in east london so we have all our ateliers we work with and when you kind of you know what it what looked like before and then you see the final garment you're like oh my god this is great and all of us in the office we kind of celebrate every when we go through qc processes it's like we like ring a bell every time because we're like look what we've made out of all this thing that all this you know piles of jeans that nobody wanted and I think that's the message that we have to all kind of appreciate and see, not waste, but actually a real a possibility for a garment that can last forever, not just being a pile of material. We have to kind of change the landscape and the lens that we look at it. Yeah, one of the things that I like about denim the most is the fact that it gets better with age. 100%. So, yeah. 100%. And I think, you know, I'm just going to say the word elastane and stretch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the problem. That really is the problem. I think I, w I think when I was talking to you, Mosh, in ages ago about it. That, anyways, that stretch and cotton aren't designed to be together. They kind of get woven in. They're like, oh hi, hi, and then six months later, it's like a really expensive divorce they can't get out of. <laughs> you know, it's like I hate you, I hate you, and then they're stuck. So we've really got to stop producing elastane in denim. That would be like, please. Uh, Jonathan, what uh, what chose what you know? Why did you choose to explore denim? Well, the short answer is uh, I went to art college, uh, shared a house with three girls, uh, walked into a cinema. Nick came and pulled his 501 pants off off himself, threw them in a laundrette. I saw the reaction of my housemates, and I thought, yeah, I'll have a bit of that. <laughs> um, but to riff off <laughs> Anna's Anna's um, Anna's point of view, uh, I ag I mean. I think, first of all, I think denim jeans, particularly the Levi's 501, is the greatest piece of clothing in the history of our human species because it's the most influential. It's been worn by more people and it's, it's offspring. Other jeans that are variants of a Levi's 501 has been worn by more people of every demographic age, you know, geographical ethnicity uh, than anything in our history, and it's been worn harder by anyone in our history. The jeans I'm wearing, these are 90s Levi's. This is a, it's probably early 60s. Uh, so I'm wearing at least 80 years of denim on me uh, right now. And there's loads of these, right? They're, they're not expensive. I've worn these all the time. They've, they've belonged to me for a long time uh, and probably belong to someone else. So I do think there is a, something to be said that denim is actually the most sustainable piece of clothing that we can wear because yeah. I, I you know let's like 80 years how many other dresses and t-shirts and anything can can stand that right both from a durability point of view but also from a relevancy point of view yeah and alex um yeah i uh i grew up in canada and my parents immigrated from Poland. And uh, growing up, I heard tons of stories about how everybody wanted a pair of jeans. But because of like trade embargoes and uh, trade prohibition, you couldn't get a pair of American jeans. So a lot of factories started to manufacture replicas in a way. Um, and just the history of how revered jeans were and everybody wanted them and they were a symbol of youth empowerment and freedom and reunification with the West. I mean, growing up, I just, it left a lifelong impression in me that denim is like to be respected, I suppose. Um, and so then when I, I started to work in design more, I, I, that, that always uh, stayed with me, yeah. Amazing. Uh, so my next question is to Anna and Alex, um, and I want to know, how does the process of upcycling denim um, influence your design approach um, and what unique challenges um, 
does it present to you? So, for instance, when you're upcycling denim, there's obviously different qualities that you are going to use together. How, how does that influence your outcome? Um, um, I learned early on that like you can't separate upcycling from the design process. It was something that I had to consider even before I knew of what I was going to make because um, I'm already restricted by the amount of material that I can use in one chunk. Um, so I'm already conscious that I have to usually compromise on a design by adding seams and extra lines. Um, and yeah, it, also have to figure out whether I want to preserve material or time, because if I want to make something quickly, then I've just got to cut it out from the jeans. But if I want to make use of every inch of the material, I have to factor in you know, extra labor for unpicking and taking the jeans apart. Um, so it's just something that I have to be conscious of from the very beginning, from the first step. Yeah. And to you, Anna? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, you know, I design from a point of waste what someone else's waste is my you know my treasure um and we are also always trying to think of more ways to be able to extract more and more material from what we have there are so many jeans that are damaged on the front or the back and you can't just ignore that i can't just go oh no it's not there it's my job to be a, i believe it's my job and my purpose to be able to try and create beautiful things out of the smallest bit of material and i think if we approach that if we all take that approach, that actually it is worth the time and the effort to go to try and extract as much as possible, then we've all, we're all on the right path to actually creating designs that last forever. Um, it, yeah, it's not easy. If someone had told me five years ago it'd been this hard, I would have probably wouldn't have done it. But actually, that's not true. I would have done it. You know, I think it's, it's, I think it makes your design process actually much more complex and actually much harder. And it's, I think, you know it's not just easy. We don't just roll out a piece of material and go, you know, cut, 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 cut. It's like you have to take in consideration the seams and we have to consider the details, the, the tops of the waist. And, you know, we're designing and we also have to think about the different hems. You know, it's our process. Each of our jeans that I get, it's, they've got, you know, five or six different kind of category labels on it, what it can make. Um, and that kind of process, we're honing our processes eat more and more and more. But I, I guess I didn't come from a traditional denim background or manufacturing background, which perhaps has had limitations, but also advantages because I don't design in a traditional way. So I think when I kind of work with pattern cutters, they're like, oh, I, and I said, no, I don't want to do it like that. And then they're like, what? And I'm like, no, I, I don't think we have to. Let's just... So you like to think yeah. outside the box. Well, I don't know in the box. Yeah. 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 So it's a good challenge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, can I ask, uh, can upcycling be scaled to large fashion companies? Jonathan, I'm going to throw that one to you first because you obviously have come from a large <laughs> fashion company. Because I often see so many um, small drops of upcycled, you know, small collections that are made from upcycled fabrics. Can this be a bigger, <laughs> a bigger thing? short answer in 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 the upcycling by taking th the existing garments apart and remaking them no is the short answer um but to get back to what anna was saying is i think and certainly at levi's we had really a i'll say it, it's not even unspoken because it was spoken a designer's hippocratic oath that we were there as designers to design things to make them better and we would put all our professional knowledge in to make a better, durable, beautiful, relevant garment because we felt that our customers deserve that. Because Levi's isn't, a, isn't an expensive company, so we would be making $29 jeans for Coles and JC Penney's, and I can guarantee you we would put as much love and effort into that, really from a, like a Hippocratic Oath point of view. And I, and I think the founders of the companies that are represented downstairs and here in this room, I think, and, and the Mills Fabrica, I think that's the fundamental belief, right? We're here to do better things, right? Um, because better is always different. Um, but to get back to your question, Kelly, is 
it's excruciatingly hard. We tried, we tried, like we worked with Heron Preston. Heron Preston was like, give, give me all your seconds, right? Levi's is highly quality controlled. There's less than like 1% of seconds grades. So it's barely anything, right, of mistakes. And it's excruciatingly hard to extract them from the system because the system is there to protect that sort of thing going onto the black market and second quality goods being sold off by cowboys. So it's really, really tough. I do think the hope to scale that in the future is the kind of mechanical and chemical recycling we do with companies like Cirque and Renew Cell, Infinited Fiber, uh, Recover and stuff like that. Because I think then you take those garments and you make them into completely new fibers, into completely new gar garments. It's kind of the modern equipment of alchemy, transforming one material into a new material. It's pretty magical. I'm really like impressed with these founders that are doing incredibly clever things. Amazing. And Anna, can upcycling be scaled to large fashion companies? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know what else to say. You know, they're not... They're just going, you know, fast fashion companies are designed to produce profit, aren't they? So there's no way, um, and that's the kind of thing where you see all these different, as you say, a small little capsule. Look, I'm not here to kind of, you know, beat down on those companies. That's not my intention, you know. With m my brand in what I do, it's always trying to be better and, you know, let them have all their little noise. It's fine. You know, it's, we're carrying on doing what I, I've seen my jeans copied on all those high street fashion brands so it's you know it's meant to be a biggest form of flattery but it doesn't really seem like it sometimes um but i it would be great you know i just think what has to stop with those fast fashion companies is all these kind of take back schemes and things like that that makes you think that you're they're taking that material and they're recycling it, and that's what probably drives me more mad than seeing my Jeep brand copied it's because it's not true they're not taking things back they're not recycling them it literally gets passed on to someone else I mean this is a whole other debate and it's putting in it's not about designing denim for the future um but it's I yeah I it just can't it, and I think they should be honest and say they can't and they should be putting all that money into working to create better materials but those met better materials aren't cheap so I don't know how then they can say they're using recycled denim when they're not because it's not made from denim but everyone thinks it is so those are the barriers and it's just you know i'm really looking forward to going downstairs and looking at what's being developed down there because i really believe that we should be able to make 100 percent denim from 100 percent denim you know why are we making it from like recycled plastic bottles or you know you know you always have those you know you hear those phrases and Denim should be made of denim. I understand the fibres are shorter and they need something to bond, but it shouldn't be. It should be then 95%. You know, it, I just think we live in this world of such technology as everyone sees and, you know, innovation. And we're only starting it. You said, you know, the fibre's too blue, but that's just the beginning. It can be better. And we should be striving for not settling for poor quality material because otherwise we're making more things under the guise of being environmentally conscious, but they're not designed to last. And they're, you're, putting more worse things out there. Uh, as William Gibson said, the future is here, but just not widely distributed, right? So all that stuff exists. You, you can definitely make denim out of denim and out of old, old clothing, right? So it doesn't, it's actually doing it a bigger favor if it's made of old clothing and just waste in general, right? Including like all your Amazon boxes and your whatever, your food cutoffs, your agricultural waste. And that, that technology exists and it's, I guess, on our generation to scale it. Yeah. Um, okay, another question for you, Jonathan. <laughs> what recent innovations have contributed to the development of new denim fabrics and how do these advan advancements impact the comfort, durability or sustainability of denim products? Okay. Um, so let's start with plants. I think regenerative farming is the big one. So uh, everybody go watch Kiss the Ground if you've not seen it on Netflix. That's, that's the biggest thing we can do. Switch all our farming to regenerative farming, including cotton. Yep. Uh, I would say alternative fibers such as hemp would be the next one. Yep. So that's in like the kind of like natural, you know, nature's ingredients. And then the one after that would be recycled cellulosics. So all those things have been 
around a long time, the kind of yeah. live cells and viscoses, tensile, shout out to lensing peeps out here and Refibra. Uh, but now we have like Cirque, shout out to Cirque and Renew Cell, Infinite Fiber, Spinova and stuff like that. So turning your old cellulose waste, turning your cardboard boxes into new clothes, making your old sweatshirt into a new pair of jeans and that new pair of, that old, when that old pair of jeans gets it's totally knackered, turning it into something else, you know, passing that on from f from us to our children and on to our grandchildren. Amazing. So a fully circular process. Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. Um, Anna, <laughs> as a denim designer, how do you strike a balance between your creative vision and the technical aspects of denim production, such as fabric composition, things like that? Um, so when I first started, I was only using rigid denim because that's what I wanted and that was my vision. Um, but unfortunately, when I started, you know, looking into it and then I think there was a certain movement where everyone started trying to upcycle denim and suddenly all the denim that I was getting, I was fighting for and nobody, it's actually stopped now. There's loads of denim available because people have realized it's so hard and so they don't want to do it anymore, <laughs> which is good for me. But during that time, we were... the the amount of denim I was getting in a bale would be 98% rigid and 2% stretch at the beginning. But then kind of fast forward four years later, it starts becoming 50-50. And so many people are throwing out their stretch denim because it stretches out of shape. And so then you end up, and so I could again, I could put my hands over my ears, uh, yeah, hand over my ears, that's it, and go, I'm not gonna touch it. But actually my job as the designer of ELV Denim is to take things that no one wants and I can't just ignore it. So we sat there and we kind of thought about it and actually if you extract the stretch and you sew around it in four seams, it can't stretch anywhere. So actually we realized we put it into our ready to wear pieces and we actually solved a problem really cleverly without ignoring it. And I think that sometimes, you know, and also you look at labels and every label has got a different percentage. And we had this, um, uh, we called it the hand. It was called Matoa and it could like hover over the material. It would tell you what percentage it was. But unfortunately denim is just this, it doesn't, let, it doesn't tell the truth. You know, it's, there's so many things underneath that you can't tell. And so we actually realized we're wasting so much time trying to analyze and assess each gene because it was given a percentage that wasn't correct. Okay. So we just had to think, right, actually common sense innovation, which is what ELV Denim was born from and what it continually evolves from, we'll make sure we'll kind of test it ourselves and then we'll decide what it goes next to. <laughs> so it's, it's about treating, uh, yeah, I would ideally have no stretch denim come into the studio, ideally, but it has to, it's there. It's a problem, we have to solve it. So I, we kind of make sure that everything gets divided up and all the stretch that we do get gets worked into ready to wear, it becomes lighter, it's easier to wear, and it's a win-win situation. So I think, I find sometimes that I think, Alex, you said it as well, you know, you can be forced to making a snap quick decision but actually take time and think about it. The answer might not come to you in the first five minutes. Maybe it takes a week, maybe it takes a month, but it's better to wait for that answer to come to you than potentially let all this stretched denim be kind of, you know, cut and sent into landfill because we've all seen those pictures where the denim with the stretch, the denim decomposes, but all you do is get left with those stretch yeah. that doesn't decompose. Yeah. If I could add, yeah. um, early on I, I've, I was the exact same. I just wanted like really nice, thick, heavy denim. And then I realized really quickly that like, it doesn't solve that much of a problem. And really I should be upcycling like all the boohoo and all the Topshop leftover jeans that are ripped up. And that addresses a greater problem, which is like this low quality stuff. How can we add more value to it and create designs that are more, leave a better impression than if they just stay the way they are. I think I mean, you can apply it to anything. You know, we now, we've, we, I, every time I go to these suppliers, I see more mater different materials. We do shirts, we do kind of, I'm upcycling bed linen from luxury hotels now because they have, there's, they just get rid of them. There's a mark on it, someone drops a pen on it and then that's chopped up and it's like this amazing, incredible, you know, luxury 300 million thread count cotton that is like, you know, literally turned into a duster or sent to landfill and it's wrong. And I think, and I don't want to keep that for me, just, that's my idea. You know, if all young designers, if they knew that there's this resource of materials out there, then we're just actually looking, applying the same concept that we have, but actually going to different industries 
and creating solutions for other people when it comes to textile waste. Um, as a denim designer, how do you strike a balance between the creative vision and the technical aspects of denim production? I, it's just part of being a designer, right? Yeah. You, 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 it's part, you're interested in, you should be interested in the technical part. Um, and you leverage that plus your own, I guess, uh, knowledge and aesthetics to, like I said, design things with the intention to make them better. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I personally, I don't have any big beef with stretch, though, I got to say, because I would say, yeah, denim is nice when it has not stretched, but then I think I'd miss it in the waistband of my underpants and, you know, uh, or if you have sporting activities, you know, you're doing that and you're thinking, yeah. So it's, it's a useful invention and it's something that human ingenuity needs to invent a better way to either to produce it and to reuse it. Yeah. So it's just a problem to be solved. Yeah. Uh, that actually moves on nicely to my next question, which is about stretch denim. <laughs> um, so stretch denim is a popular choice for its comfort. And how do you envision the future of stretch denim in a more eco-conscious fashion industry? Or do you envision it, should I say, <laughs> at uh, all? <laughs> so. Uh, the the kind of like holy grail of like recycling, um, it's spandex has been really, really tough. Um, right now, I think the only one is uh, Regen by Creora, um, uh, by Hyosung actually, a South Korean company. I think that's the only like 100% recycled spandex on the market. Um, I know Lycra have got a, a version that has some recycled content in that as well. So I th again, I think that's a problem to be solved. But I do think the basic kind of human desire to have things more stretchy and comfortable is a legitimate comfort need. Just like we don't want like, I don't know, made jeans made of like lamb's wool that make our legs itch, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it, it is a legitimate need that, that we've solved through our ingenuity. It's just the kind of negative side effects of, I guess from a sustainability angle are still to be resolved. Yeah, I'm gonna throw that to you, Anna, as well. <laughs> I think we all know my view on stretch. Um, <laughs> I just, yeah, I, I, I hear what you say. It's just the trouble is that the stretch is put in, it's made in such bad in such bad way in lots with when it comes to so many different high street brands or and it just stretches out of shape it just puckers it's not flattering so i think again as you say it's about the responsibility of those people creating that fiber to make it a better quality so it does last yeah so you know if it has to be done i can't believe i'm saying that but uh, yeah <laughs> and alexandra what do you think um i'm very anti-stretch um i just don't, I, I, it, I find it personally really hard to upcycle it because it doesn't, I mean, most of my work just takes on a different shape completely and I like to build structure with it and I can't do that with stretch at all. Um, and then on a practical level, yeah, I, I find it breaks down a lot faster and it's not even necessarily more comfortable. Like I find salvage jeans that I've broken myself over years are way more comfortable than some random stretch pair of jeans. Yeah. I can agree there. <laughs> um, so another question. Uh, what is the future of denim? And that's to all of you. <laughs> Whoever wants to go first. Um, I'll give a really naive and idealized answer. And I, I hope it's upcycling and making things from waste. But more realistically, it's probably like materials that mills have put a lot of R&D and effort into developing, probably stuff with like improved farming practices. Um, and yeah, I think from a design perspective, it's definitely encouraging all designers to have a practice that considers at least a couple elements to incorporate sustainability and overall to just make sure garments um, become a bit more sustainable so that it's taking a step in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, I completely echo what you, what you say. It's, we, we can't be satisfied with the levels of recycled materials out there, that's for sure. We have to also, 
you know, celebrate upcycling in a way that it is, you know, we're all striving for a world of, individual, you know, a garment, a clothing, pieces of individuality, so we don't all look the same. And I think upcycling really just literally delivers that on the plate. Um, I mean, the change in five years since I started to now is incredible. And it's so lovely to see other people and, you know, so many designers, that's, that's the basis of what they do. Yes, it is hard, but that's okay. It's okay for something to be hard and not instantaneous. And I think that's also the mindset we have to achieve that the instant result is not necessarily the one you go with. I can just imagine everyone, like people in a boardroom going, oh, brilliant, we've done it, move on. But actually, you have to constantly be better. That's what designers do. They're always new collection, being better, as you said, always striving for that. We, we can't just be happy with what the status quo is now. And I would, that's what I would like to see the change. And then, what well, is the future? Okay, the future. <laughs> Let me offer two thought exercises. The first one is where we are on the sustainability horizon, right? Where most of us are is we're just trying to do a little bit less bad. So we're trying to waste less, use more recycled content, organic instead of conventional and stuff like that. So if we pull that timeline further forward, the next step is to do no bad, right? So everything is circular uh, or renewable. And then the final stop on that sustainability station is, um, is can we make clothing in a way that it's actually better for the environment and for our planet and for our people than if we did not make it. So can we farm in a regenerative way, create and produce things like can our factories clean more water than they use, gather more solar, wind, water energy than they use, give back to society and educate people more than, you know, than just sewing. Um, and I think we can. So that's the first thing. So can, can we give back more than we take? Yes, we can. And that's on our doorsteps right now. The second one is let's close our eyes and fast forward ourselves 10, 20 years into the future. Uh, and it's about technology, right? And right now we go into a store or, or e-com and we look around and pick our stuff. In the future, um, AI will say, hey, Kelly, you, you're back again. Um, I kind of know what you want, just pick a color, you know, and you'll go, okay, I want low rise, baggy jeans in a wash down black. And, and it'll say, hey, Kelly, uh, you know, come, come back in a couple of hours, I've got, I've got it for you, right? And it's technologies like Walden's uh, Unspun that will produce things on demand, right? From really from fiber to thread to a finished garment, you know, and, and, and putting that together with technologies like Cirque and Hue and Colorifics and stuff like that, right? So it's kind of like we're two years before iPhone 1, all the ingredients exist, You've, we've just got to put them together. So that future where you, you walk in, right, and we can make your thing, and then we can remake it into something else when you're tired of it, uh, the ingredients, are pretty much here now. We've got to put them together. Okay, amazing. I think I have run out of time, right? Yep, okay, thank you so much. Thank you. It was really insightful. Next up to talk about the huge topic of circularity, I'd like to introduce on stage Francois Souchet, uh, Francesca <laughs> Sila um, from Beyond Retro and also Cindy Rhodes from Born Again. Thanks Amy. Hello everyone. Good morning. So the, the context into this conversation is that I've, as we've discussed already, there's billions of pairs of denims that are created every year. Their material composition is increasingly complex and there's a tendency of creating products that are made with materials that are less and less durable from a kind of physical perspective, which means they wear out faster. 
And so all this sort of contributes to the huge issue around uh, waste and pollution in the fashion industry. And if we want to solve this problem, there are sort of two key aspects. The first one is to use more, the second one is to make less. And the conundrum around that is how can we continue to create economic value, opportunity, and, and, and design um, sort of creativity ideas. Um, and the research that I've led for a long while and that uh, a lot of people are putting in practice in this room around circular economy shows that there's, there's an opportunity to sort of solve for both business and environment using the principle. And the, the vision we put for a circular economy when I was at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation a few years ago was that um, a circular economy for fashion has sort of three components. The first one is products that are used more. The second one is products that are made to be made again. And the third one is products that are made from safe and renewable or recycled material. So we will dive into some of the elements around this with uh, both Cindy and Francesca. Um, but first, I will let them explain um, their organization and, and who they are um, and the extreme amount of expertise they can contribute to our panel. You're looking at me. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks, Francois. Uh, so my name's Cindy Rhodes. I'm the founder of Warn Again Technologies. And we have been in development of a chemical recycling technology that can separate polyester and cotton. It can decontaminate those raw materials, extract them, and produce two virgin equivalent outputs, uh, both a PET pellet and a cellulosic pulp, similar to uh, some of the technologies that Jonathan was talking about, um, namely CERC with the two outputs. And uh, we are currently uh, building our thousand ton demonstration plant just outside Zurich, which will be up and running next year. And that will act as the the blueprint for the industrial scale uh, um, process that we aim to license to plant operators around the world. And I think just to say about this morning, it's been really fascinating because uh, I don't come from the world of, of denim, which is very specific. I come from the pool of everything, all, all those textiles out there that end up at an end of use textile recycling plant to be sorted, separated, hopefully resold for re rewear and sometimes I'm sold for recycling, but not very much is recycled, less than 1%. Um, so it's been inspiring to hear about the upcycling that's been happening, because that's where we started out many years ago, before the technology. And it's great to see that this entire space is accelerating, but I don't think it's happening quick enough. Um, yeah, so I am the marketing director for Beyond Retro. However, perhaps a lot of people in this room will know Beyond Retro, but they don't know the group of companies um, but Bank & Vogue, which is the parent company of a set of three, um, is the largest broker of second-hand goods in the world. So they're working with social enterprise and charities to kind of help divert the leftover donations that would end up in landfill and resell that back into second-hand retailing. Beyond Retro was born um, a few years into that business um, operating because they were finding this incredible vintage and they were like, you know, w there's an opportunity here for us to create a brand. Obviously, that's 21 years down the line and we'll talk a little bit about how far that journey's come in those years in with Beyond Retro. But about six years ago, um, they were just like, as you said, it's not moving fast enough. There's more we can do. And we really focus on maintaining the value of secondhand goods. So an innovation arm was set up and that's really focused on remanufacturing post-consumer textiles through upcycling, working with brands such as Renew Cell um, to kind of do the chemical recycling piece and then also component manufacturing. So we will take um, a a design and a pattern from a brand, we will then cut those panels for that design and then we will send that back to their partner factory and then we will recycle the waste. So it's reducing the carbon footprint um, and really, again, finding a new solution for the product that's already in existence. So it's quite a multifaceted business, but all trying to work together in kind of enabling a more circular approach with second hand. Perfect. So we'll dive into both of those aspects um, in more detail, starting with um, the idea of 
using products more, um, which, as you said, is something that uh, the, the Bank Envoy Group has been doing for over 20 years. Um, maybe the first question for you, Francesca, then is, what what are the key elements, and if let's just keep this around Denim for, for now, but it's probably applicable to more, but what are the key elements that can enable Denim to be used more? Well, I think actually listening to the conversation before fundamentally is really about quality and, you know, attention to detail in that production. I mean, vintage product, um, and we see this in Beyond Retro, it's one of our best selling product categories. It's because the quality of vintage denim was just far stronger. So, you know, modern multi-fiber denims in the last 15 years, they just, you know, and it goes back to that stretch conversation, you know, it's just, it's, it's just not as good enough quality. So not not only for it to last longer, it's about kind of educating the consumer that some of those products already in existence from a long time ago or some of the newer, better quality materials on the market are actually a better choice for you in, orbit, in order to be able to keep that product for longer. We also, you know, really advocate like repair and care. I know that seems like quite a big buzzword at the moment in the marketing space with brands, but it's something we really truly have pioneered for a long time. But you know, there's incredible businesses like Sojo and The Seam that are really trying to take the wider consumer to understanding how you can actually care for a product for longer. We probably all know in this room that you know you don't need to wash a pair of jeans until you've worn them 15, 20 times really. But actually you'd be surprised how many customers don't realize that or are so they don't realize the environmental impact. So we're trying to commit ourselves into trying to educate the customer and how they can actually just keep those products. We are about to launch a repair cafe um, in our Bristol store, which will then tour to Brighton and then it's going to come to London. And we're hoping that that's going to be something that we're going to ongoingly have as part of our overall business. We do partner with Sojo at the moment as well. And then we recently just launched a monthly repair care workshop in Gothenburg as well in our Swedish side of the business. So, you know, it's a really just about kind of, I think a lot of it's about education and understanding how you can keep a garment for longer, but perhaps also understanding what makes a quality piece of product. So we're trying to introduce into our communication strategy education for the consumer even more so. So understanding what makes a good quality garment why it's good quality and hopefully why you should come to us and so purchase it. Do you have it. examples of that? Examples of criteria that you use to uh, define the quality of a garment? I think we look at kind of how it's been made and then also the composition of that material. So it definitely, the products that we have are from 20, 25, 30 years ago. So you can definitely tell a quality pair of jeans from just feeling them and like touching the texture and understand it. I mean, I'm definitely not technical when it comes to the material composition, um, but you know, in terms of how we look at a product, you know, as is all around looking at like really maintaining pieces from the past that are great quality. And I think to, to, to some of the, the, the things you were saying around the education of, of your customers, I feel there's also sort of a, a, a broader trend in terms of sort of normalization of 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 new behavior and kind of considering um, second hand as a option when when shopping, um, and I think that you've done a lot of work with with Beyond Retro to sort of be part of this normalization. Can you explain a little bit sort of the, the approach that you had beyond educating, sort of to also make it cool and something that people will consider from the outset? Yeah, I mean, if you think about when Beyond Retro started 21 years ago, you know, it was one single shop on Cheshire Street, probably one of the most iconic if you're a Londoner and lived in East London. I and mean, it was an incredible store. But what we've tried to do over, you know, the last 20 years is change the thought process that vintage retail should be on a side street and niche. Uh, actually, really, our business model is not about being just another vintage retailer. It's about being on the high street and that we sell secondhand. So it's relevant trends of the day that just happen to be vintage and secondhand so that we can sit on Argyle Street next to and other stories and we can create visibility and volume for people walking in one of the most highly trafficked streets in the world to actually realize that, oh my God, I can go in here and I can buy exactly what I could have bought from H&M or somewhere else. You know, we're just trying to give people that option. So I definitely think working with Selfridges was a really big step for the business as well. So we had a pop-up with them. I 
I've only been in the company for a year, but I believe it was a couple of years ago. And then that also was a stepping stone to that Argyle Street location. We're now in Cold Drops Yard, which is incredible. We've got stores in Westfields. I mean, I think that one, Argyle Street's incredible. And don't get me wrong, it's an amazing place, but it's an inner city. It's on the high street. You do see a lot of variation. I think the fact that there's a Beyond Retro in a Westfield mall is is a pretty big step in terms of the wider consumer perception of how secondhand can be just part of your everyday choice. So it's, um, and I think we can't underestimate the Love Island eBay impact on secondhand perception. Um, and I know that's focused on a different type of product perhaps, but it still is trend and it's still really catapulted. Because again, you know, when you work in the fashion industry, sometimes you're in a little bit of a bubble and you don't realize, or if you're in London or in a city, but it's still quite a big value action gap from where the customer values are into actually purchasing. So when things like Love Island that's on your TV, on the mainstream TV, it's had a huge impact. And, and I definitely think in terms of support we get even from press coverage in the last two or three years, you know, we're getting incredible support as well from like the press to help that visibility. And one of the, the you know, anecdotes that I love is the fact that the Beyond Retro Shop in Selfridges took the position of Topshop when they went bankrupt, which was quite ironic. Um, so now the, the second part of this conversation is around when you can't use clothing anymore, how can you kind of turn them into new clothing again? And that's where you've been needing incredible work and, and research over the past decade or so. I guess. Um, so the, the first thing is, the first question for, for you, Cindy, is sort of what is chemical recycling and sort of what are the sort of promises that it offers, in, especially regarding the technology that you are developing? Yeah, sure. So I guess the easiest way to categorize it is you've got mechanical recycling and chemical recycling. Mechanical has been happening for many, many years, um, often uh, turning end-of-use textiles into second life products that maybe go into insulation, uh, furniture stuffing, that sort of thing, but not necessarily textile to textile. Uh, saying that though, some of the mechanical recycling processes over the last couple of years have really improved in terms of the quality of what they're producing, but ultimately what goes in comes out. So you have limitations with um, quality, with design, but still absolutely there are many applications for mechanical recycling. Um, and definitely part of the solution. Uh, when it comes to chemical recycling, I think the key difference is that what we're able to do, and there's multiple, there's a, a handful of different types of processes out there that deal with different fiber, um, they have different processes and different outputs, but ultimately what we're doing with chemical recycling is we're able to um, recapture the raw material and restore it back to a virgin equivalent quality, certainly in the case of polyester. So um, we're breaking it down, we're separating it from the cotton. We recapture, in our process, we're recapturing the polymer from the polyester, which during its use will become slightly damaged as you put it through the washing machine. But we have a finishing step that brings it back up to a virgin equivalent um, polymer chain. So the quality is restored. Uh, others like Cirque are um, depolymerizing the polyester. So they're breaking it down to monomers and then they're building it back up from there. But what this allows us to do is really purify the raw materials, um, separate out all the contaminants, the dyes, the finishes, everything that went in to produce that virgin equivalent uh, uh, output. Um, in the case of cotton, we, most of you will know, um, you can't turn cotton back into cotton in a purest form because the, the fiber length is reduced um, and damaged throughout wear and tear. But with chemical recycling, with Renew Cell and some of the others, we're able to um, break it down and recapture the cellulose to produce a cellulosic pulp that can go back into fiber spinning. So for me, it's, you know, chemical recycling will enable us to almost replace the the majority of, of virgin resources. And so the the question I have for, for you next is this you you've the technology has been quite a few years in into development. Um, what 
what are the barriers to sort of bring it to market to scaling like what are some of the complexities that you are finding in going from something that works in a lab to having a pilot facility that's able to take thousands of tons a year and like what's been your journey so there are many barriers uh the technology itself isn't that difficult, it's just time consuming because you'll always come up against challenges when you're developing a new technology. But with good scientists, you can always overcome it. I think one of the key barriers, which is non-tech, has been uh, trying to take a technology from lab scale to industrial scale takes a lot of money and you will meet no venture capitalists out there who are interested in a 10 year runway. Mm -hmm. So we had to go about um, finding strategic partners, uh, investors that really wanted to be part of the solution and needed it. Our, our first investor was H&M. Uh, we also had some support from Caring in terms of R&D. And throughout our development timeline, we've brought in new partners like our chemical engineering firm, uh, a Swiss company called Solzer, and Erlikon came in in 2020. So that's been the tricky part. Um, the technology part, absolutely. I mean, you do something in test tubes. I, we were very naive in 2012. We had our test tubes of you know, polyester and recaptured from these end of use textiles. We thought we had the answer. We, I think we did, but it was just many years away because taking that up to you know, different scales um, through scaling, through pilot to demo, it just takes time and it takes money. Um, so those are some of the barriers. Um, I think another one that's really, I've been thinking a lot more about is, you know, we've always said we need the brands. We need, the brands are the voice to, you know, to society. They have that connection with customers, with citizens. And we've, we've always understood the pull and the need for the brands to say, this is what we need, and to start making commitments, and to say, look, when this is up and running, we want to take, you know, 100,000 tons, a million tons, you know, scale as quickly as you can. But we're not seeing that pull as much as we would expect or need. So there's a lot of talk about it, and the work that, that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation did, absolutely very helpful. I think there's a lot of noise, that the awareness levels are much higher, but the real hardcore commitments just aren't coming through in some of the companies that we're seeing already kind of up and running. So that's an area I'd like to see progress further. You know, obviously subject to quality, subject to, to cost. You know, we all have to work on this together. But if the industry wants these solutions, I mean, when it comes to polyester, I totally agree. I mean, I used to think polyester was the devil as well. But the chat, and maybe it is for denim, but I think in, in, in the wider sense, we already have hundreds of millions of tons of this stuff in existence today. So what I would say is let's, let's um, ban, let's stop making polyester from oil, but let's you know, scale up these processes that can keep existing polyester in continual circulation again and again, and keep it out of the rivers and the oceans and the water, but definitely stop new and you know, really scale um, circular processes. And um, what are there any recent developments that that have helped overcome some of those bio new things? And a side question after this, that I just thought about. <laughs> I hope it's not too, too tricky, but it's like when you're depolymerizing, too complicated to say, so let's blame it on Call the it uh, translation. Um, the um, do do you have any waste that comes from it and like? dyes finishing other sort of chemicals and sort of what can you do with it or do you do and and then some no it's a very good question and kind of like the mechanical recycling everything that goes in comes out but it doesn't come out in the product we're able to purify the product but we still have that waste stream and it comes out as a sludge mm. and it's everything it's elastane it's dyes it's everything that went in um, what can we do with it? Well, that's an ongoing evolution. Um, we've done some trials with a company in the Netherlands that's able to recapture the dye and re-dye things black. Um, I mean, ultimately, we could recover things like the elastane because it's a polymer 
um, but it would add an additional processing step and the economics of that versus the value of what you would get out don't quite match up now. Um, so I think there's a combination of evolving the technology, like our goal is to get this process industrialized and recapturing polyester and cellulose um, in phase one. Phase two, we can start building in um, more intelligent ways of you know what to do. It, with its industrial waste, maybe we can recapture more um, and find ways to valorize some of that waste. But equally, the, the biggest shift that's happened in the last 10 years is we're in this room now talking about designing for circularity. So hopefully some of that bad stuff going in is gonna be designed out so we don't have to deal with it because that affects our yield, right? So the more polyester and cotton that goes into uh, a recycling process, the more outputs we will get and the better the economics. Yeah. And when we, the, the previous conversation also mentioned the idea of upcycling with some companies that were um, really involved in, in it. Um, and Bank and Vogue has been involved in also upcycling, so that's kind of like a sort of intermediary loop between the reuse and the sort of recycling. It's like how do you maintain, do you keep the materials? Um, and one of the things that you've been doing is actually taking those materials from one product and putting them into another product. Can you, uh, Francesca, tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you've done? Yeah, in so space? we've been trying to do quite a lot in this space. I mean, our biggest partner today on the component manufacturing is Converse. Um, we work different ways with brands. So we might work in a white label fashion as a, I suppose, a manufacturing input by sourcing. So we'll talk with a brand, see what they're looking for, show them kind of the swatch books of kind of the available materials. We do specialize in denim, suede, um, a lot of kind of like flannel and cords and things like that. But, you know, the sky's the limit, there's a lot of products in the world. Um, and then we'll work with their design and production teams to source the material. And then like I said, we'll cut that pattern. So Converse we've been working with, they definitely were kind of very early to adopt the idea of this process. Um, and we really want to try and work with more brands to build this into part of their production process. You know, I'm not saying it's the only thing that they could do, but how could they have parts of their collection ongoingly? And we also have the ability to do that at scale. So we have one of the largest manufacturing plants um, in the world to be able to do it at a larger scale than say other places. Um, but you know, some of those projects are co-branded or are partnered with Beyond Retro. So you know, if that brand has a kind of natural synergy to Beyond Retro, we'll source that material through vintage shirts that will then essentially be created and upcycled into something new. Um, last year we launched um, Beyond Remade, which is our own very baby new brand, which you might have seen in the um, exhibition space downstairs, um, which is 100% upcycled from post-consumer denim um, and suede. Uh, it's uh, very much a showcase, I think, for what's possible. Um, and, you know, we're not saying that patchwork is the only way forward in that space. That's just obviously the design um, aesthetic that we've gone for initially. Um, and we're really looking to kind of evolve that and kind of grow that into its kind of organically into a brand. Um, and, we, you know, we're also looking at ways in which we could partner with other upcycle, like, di designers to kind of help also create new pieces for those collections. And then we have... This is actually from our Beyond Retro label collection. So we do things where we take vintage pieces and we'll resize, or this is, I think they call this technique nip and tuck. Um, so we'll take workwear or denim and then we'll resize that for a cut that maybe, and that's actually, to be honest, is literally our best at the moment. The resized workwear and denim is at the top of our best sellers for what pe people just love it. They literally, we can't, we can't make enough of it in terms of like what people want from it. So, and repairing pieces like wool and things like, you know, little holes with cool fabrics. So we've kind of definitely trying to kind of, we're in multi spaces in kind of how we're working with people. So the exciting thing for us and the work that we've been doing is obviously been quite a long journey. Some of these conversations with the brands are four or five years in the making, you know, because it's such a different way of thinking, you know, kind of because the quality control that we've been used to for so long with producing kind of virgin materials is you know you can have exactly all the same whereas obviously when you're working with post-consumer it can't be quite as tightly regimented as that and so I think that's been quite an evolution but between March and May next year we have four 
I can't even tell you the names of the brands, but four very huge um, global brands that we have product coming out with. And I think for us, that's super exciting because I think it's going to be a real step change to show the industry that we can do it on this scale with these brands. So I think that's so it's definitely exciting times, but it's been a lot of hard work. And I don't think I can take the credit for it, but hopefully I can help communicate it going forward. Nice. And I, I guess it's, as a, as a conclusion, I think, that, that notion of moving to scale, sort of moving beyond the constant pilot phase. I mean, you, you had, I don't know how many pilots with many brands and sort of now being, okay, well, can we get volumes? Can we move beyond this and, and same for you, moving beyond this, this notion of, of test and when stuff is proven, actually helping to scale it, getting the, the financing and the infrastructure that, that helps is, is a key element towards sort of ensuring that denim doesn't become waste. And the other thing that I remember from this is also the importance of design material choices from the outset and construction to make sure that what goes in the system actually can work within that sort of fashion ecosystem and can be uh, remade and then eventually recycle into into new product. Um, we haven't touched on the uh, uh, notion of materials because that's going to be discussed in, in depth in, in some of the following conversations. So um, we focused on, on the first two elements. But thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I think we have a break now, right? Yes. So enjoy some coffee. So next up, I'd like to invite on stage um, Dolores from Good Eth Cotton to talk about carbon positive cotton. Dolores. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is uh, Dolores. I come from Barcelona. You can notice the accent. And I'm uh, the regional manager for both Good Earth Cotton and uh, Fiverr Trace. So, Good Earth Cotton. <coughs> Here. Um, Good Earth Cotton is... Um, Good Earth Cotton was founded by Danny and Danielle and David Statham. They are the second generation of uh, cotton farmers. And they, are a family, they have a family-owned business called Sundown Pastoral in Australia. And what Danny and David have uh, founded, Good Earth Cotton, is a program of regenerative agriculture that delivers climate positive impact, climate positive results. We were at the beginning only two farms, our own farms, but now currently in Australia, other six farms have joined the program. Um, we have always been driven by best practices and always looking at new ways of doing agriculture. Regenerative, practice, re regenerative agriculture is something that we have been doing since the light, late 1990s and 2000. And here are some of the key um, practices that we do in our farms. First of all, and very important, we do zero to minimum tillage. And why that? The main reason is that we want to avoid, to avoid releasing the carbon that has been sequestered by, uh, by the plants via photosynthesis. Uh, we want to avoid to release this carbon back into the atmosphere. Another thing we do that is very important is crop rotation. So we grow cotton one year in one field, but the next year we will grow wheat that has a root system that is very good for the structure of soil and also for the microorganisms in the soil. After wheat, we will grow um, chickpeas or other legumes. So this um, rotation is very important in terms of biodiversity and in terms of bringing a variety of nutrients to the soil. We um, also we also um, try to keep as much as possible carbon back to the soil. So after a harvest, what we will do will be to mulch the stems of the plants that are in the field. We will not take them out. We will mulch them so that all this carbon that has been stocked in the plants go back to the soil. We will do similar with the trash and the waste from our genes. So we will bring all this waste, the residues of the plants, the cotton, uh, the cotton plants, and we will put it back into the field 
to give more nutrients. So all these, all these um, activities, what are doing is to put carbon into the soil. The higher the levels of carbon in the soil, the healthier the soils. The healthier the soils, the better the result. So for your understanding, in Australia, a standard cotton farm produces 11 hectares per bale, while a good earth cotton farm we produce from 14 to 16 hectares per bale. So good earth cotton practices, higher productivity, but we have another advantage is that we need less inputs. So we use uh, organic amendments like biochar or compost or animal manure, and we reduce the dependence on synthetic fertilizers. We also use natural pest management. So like the image you see here, you see pigeon peas plants uh, next uh, to the cotton uh, to the cotton plants, giving a natural repellency protection against pests. So this also um, is good for us in terms of using less uh, chemicals for pesticides. We are also transitioning to renewable energies. So we are building the capacity in our farms to be in four years. Um, almost completely uh, renewable. So 95% of all the energy we'll be using in all our operations from tractors to gene will be uh, coming from clean energy. And of course, we take care of biodiversity. We um, protect and, uh, and take care of our native vegetation that is going to work as windbreaks, natural windbreaks and uh, as habitats for insects, birds and all sorts of animals. We rely very much on science and technology. So in 2003, we were picked by the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial and Research Organization to be their research center for agricultural practices uh, based on science. And we have been working also since 2003 with the University of, Quiz of Queensland. So for, third, so for 20 years, we have been working with scientists and with agronomists, and we rely very much on science to make our program. We also rely on technology. The images here are of a state-of-the-art technology that combines um, satellite data with artificial intelligence and allows us to understand what are the levels of carbon in soil uh, with a very um, accurate precision. We also use telemetry to understand what are the levels of humidity in the soil or to understand what is the temperature of the plants if there is any stress. So all this technology allows us to, um, um, to act with precision and accuracy and when it is needed. Not only that, we rely very much on technology also to gather data. For us, data is very important. Without data, we could not improve. And this is a list of, um, of the data that we um, uh, collect and gather on a year, every year, sorry, on a farm per farm basis. So um, we take samples from soil and hundreds of samples, so that we understand with accuracy the level of carbon in there. And we also take uh, um, accountability. We measure our vegetation, our energy consumption, chemicals, uh, transports, livestock, etc. So this, um, rob this rigorous way I mean, this rigorous philosophy of gathering data is what makes of Good Earth Cotton a very robust pro program. And not only that, we calculate and we measure our impact every year. So an LCA is performed using a methodology that is interna internationally accredited, for, um, complying, with, complying with ISO 14064, related to reductions of GHG emissions. And uh, so we are using, for doing all these uh, metrics and assessment and LCAs, we are using the primary inventory data that we collect. This is all third party verified by SGS and second party verified by Carbon Friendly. So every year we understand with precision for each of our farms what is the impact that we are um, doing with our activities. And what we have seen since the last 20 years is that the soil, sorry, the health of our soils have been improving year after year. 
and in 2017 we achieved climate posi positivity. So we were able to sequester more carbon than we emitted. And we were the first cotton farm in the world doing that. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Um, we share all this information with our partners. So this is an excerpt of the report that we share with our brand partners, our meal partners, so that anyone working with us can understand with precision from each farm what have been the main sources of emissions and the main things for sequestration. And this is very important for us, as I say, because without all this data, we could not have improved. So here you can see a comparison, right? So you can see that an, a bale of a standard conventional cotton uh, has a net emission of more than 200 kilos of CO2 per bale, while a good earth cotton bale is able to sequester or have a net sequestration of more than 300 um, CO2, kilos of CO2 per bale. And this is huge. Uh, this is like taking out of the road more than 9,000 cars. So when we talk about natural fibers being sustainable or um, not sustainable, I think we should, we should differentiate in terms of what sustainability is, right? <laughs> we agree. Uh, what sustainability is, and um, we, we, we need to understand what is doing less bad, or what is, a lit what is more good, or what is bringing um, climate positivity, what is fostering biodiversity, what is running on clean energy. That is the reason we think that with this kind of practices, we can heal not only an industry, but also a planet. So what are the things that we achieve at, and we bring to our partners? First of all, we reduce climate impact, right? By, by our uh, regenerative agriculture practices and in combination with uh, primary data collection, assessment and, uh, and audit. And then, and very important, we also enhance the role of cotton farmers. Um, not only that, we also can improve livelihoods. So good earth cotton practices mean higher yield, less inputs, so better income. It also means healthier soils, which means healthy environment and um, healthy communities around the farms. And not only that, we can also find a second revenue, a second stream of revenue, sorry, that can come from the carbon credits that the farmers are able to produce. And uh, last but not least, we want to provide authenticity and trust to the, in, to the textile industry. And that is the reason why we um, apply the fiber trace technology to our cotton. In fact, we founded Good Earth Cotton because we wanted to make sure that the fiber we were delivering was the fiber that was going to be in the shelf. So for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the video, sorry, and I'm going to jump into fiber trace. So what is fiber trace? Fiber trace is a technology that combines digital traceability with physical authentication. So the best way to explain the technology, at least for me, is to explain the three components of, of fiber trace. The first component is a luminescent ceramic pigment. So here you have a small sample of it. It looks like kitchen flour. It's very fine. It's 1.5 to 3 microns. It is added in a very low uh, quantity from 0.1 to 0.2 percent. Um, and we apply it at the very early stage of the supply chain. So for cotton, it would be at the gin. For wool, it could be uh, after scouring. Um, once we apply the, the, the tracer, it gets bonded to the fiber and it's not, there is no way to separate it. So it lasts uh, forever. It's very, it's very strong and resistant. It just stands up at 1700 degrees. So it makes it very uh, suitable for all textile processes and for recycling. Um, 
So this is the pigment. The second component of the technology is the scanner. We have uh, one downstairs, so anyone want a demonstration, I can show. But this scanner is a very, it's a quite small device. It's not bigger than my, not much bigger than my mobile, and it's very light. And it does very uh, amazing things. It emits an infrared, and when the fabric with fiber trace uh, detects the infrared, it reflects a signal. So the scanner is also going to read this signal, and it's going to understand what is the frequency and the and the length of the wave that is, uh, that is reading. And this is very important because we can engineer the pigment to have a certain frequency and a certain wave of length, so we can assign identities to the pigment. Currently, Guthers Cotton has its own identity. We have also identities for regenerative cotton from India, uh, for linen, and for other fibers. So the scanner will, able, will be able to detect um, on real time, in the moment, yes, uh, fiber trace is in here. And we also will be able to detect what is the identity of the fiber that is scanning. It will also do another thing, because it's geolocated, it will say where the scan is being done and, and, uh, and where. All this information connects via Bluetooth to the third component of the technology, which is our digital platform. So we have built a digital platform that responds to the needs of the textile industry. Um, brands, retailers, and any stakeholder of the, of, the, of the industry can map the whole entire supply chains with a, with a platform, and I can also use it to centralize a um, big range of information, like company details, product details, specifications, orders, etc. So, so there is a, um, a connection between what happens in, in real life when auditing and scanning the garments, and all this information gets uploaded to, uh, to the platform. The platform is based on uh, blockchain technology. So all these transactions and all these scan, uh, audits and scannings get recorded and locked into the platform. So this is an example of how it will work, for example, in the cotton, in the cotton industry. The farmer would apply the fiber trace in the gene. The, the tracer would, would bond to the fiber. And, um, and the farmer would uh, scan the bale of cotton. So the identity will be uploaded to the platform, this is good as cotton, and the intensity also. I didn't say that, but it's very important. The scanner is also able to understand by the intensity of the signal, it's also able to understand what is the amount of pigment in the fabric. And this is very important because if we see int drops dropping intensity, in the supply chain, we might need to investigate if there has been any kind of blending in the process. So the farmer would scan the bale, the bale of cotton, the, the intensity and the identity would go to the platform and the bale of cotton would be sent to the spinner. The spinner would receive the bale of cotton with a scanner, would scan it and in real time would say, yes, the tracer is here, yes, it is good as cotton, all is fine, I can do my yarns. When the yards are done, the spinner would make an outbound um, a scan. So again, all the information on the platform and the process will be repeated through the whole supply chain until it arrives to, um, to the brand. At the end of the process, the brand is able to emit a QR, to issue a QR code for every product so that it's able to share the journey of the fiber from farm to shelf with their consumers. So I, I want to, I want to, um, I want to note that we started with cotton, but currently we are tracing all kind of fibers. So uh, wool, we are able to trace wool, linen, um, also um, recycled fibers, recycled cotton, responsible viscose, and many other fibers. And this is a, you can scan this, um, this QR code and have a look of how fiber trace works. 
and how the consumer can interact with information that the platform is, um, is, is holding. So you will see that the whole journey of, this is a demo, but you will see that the whole journey of the Fiverr is showcased with details of all the processes, of where the processes have been done, and all other information that the brands or the meals wanted to share with, uh, with, uh, with the customer. So as you see with uh, this kind of uh, tool, we are, we are getting prepared, or we are supporting companies getting prepared for things like digital product passport and the new legislation that is coming in, U in, the U in Europe and in the US. So digital traceability, physical authentication, so that you are able to um, back your claims. And not only that, because we are able to trace and authenticate on real time, we can support brands in, order, in terms of risk mitigation and making, making the process of authenticating a fiber much cheaper and fast. And of course, we support brands that are doing the good things to be able to communicate that with their consumer and the customers, and so that we all support and work for having a more a healthier, a more transparent and authentic fashion industry. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. The next to talk about the future of manufacturing, delighted to invite on stage Sarah Kent uh, from the Business of Fashion, Walden Lamb, co-founder CEO of Unspun, Arshia Lal, Director of Corporate Development at Cirque, and last but not least, Tunjai Kilichan, Head of Global Business Development, Denim at Lensing Group. Hi everyone, um, it's great to be here and I'm very excited to have this panel because I think the companies that each and every one of you work for has already been shouted out this morning as sort of one of many very exciting innovations that are ongoing. Um, in the denim space at the moment. And I, I wanna get on to talking about that. But before we do, Tundra, I wanna start with you, even though you're furthest away from me, because you've got nearly 20 years of experience, I think, in this business. And so you've seen how the denim industry has evolved over the last 20 years. I wondered if you could just fill us in a little bit about how you've seen it changing and, and where you think it still needs to go. Uh, well, you hear me, I guess. The first couple of sessions were about nice innovations, how was going on, all these startups. I think we'll be talking more into reality on this panel, which is great. Um, as you said, I've spent two decades in the industry, in the production side. Well, I was doing product development in ISCO, uh, the fabric mill, and I just switched to lensing a year ago. Well, uh, the transaction is pretty good, I would say, the recognition, the understanding, the, the question, the demand, like organic cotton was there even 15 years ago, and the startups were already there. As uh, Jonathan said, the future is now, but if you understand it, like it's happening, most of the things are available, but the attention was not there yet. When one, one, once I started to ISCO, there was only one type of cotton. Like, cotton is cotton. <laughs> so there's, there's no kind of choir in that. But now there's more understanding. There's even sometimes a lot of information, maybe more than what we need. Sometimes you're missing the scope. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of things happened, especially like the laundry side of denim has improved tremendously. Alicia is here now from Tonello. She, she knows better than me. And then this transaction, the laundry side is huge. So in every pillars, there is... There's more demand, there's more query, and I hope the same demand comes from the street as well, so that we can get the reward, all of these works happens. Is it something? Well, within that, what do you think is still missing? Yeah, the street. I think there's the demand from the consumers. What's yeah, like, like, like part of the, um, the, the, part of the, um, the street, like the consumers, they're kind of exploring new stuff, second hand, resale, rebuy, fantastic, but there's a big part of the uh, street which is, I don't know if they spend a lot of interest on what is organic cotton, what is recycling, what is all these certifications. Are they really giving the um, credit to all of the things that we, our industry has been transformed? Like, I mean, that's the thing I would think. Otherwise, our all efforts would be rewardless. So then you ask the question, why? Like, for instance, 
I, she's making fantastic organic jeans, and I'm making just the cheap, nasty stuff. So we're selling in the shop, and mine is cheaper. Sorry, yours, yours is more expensive, mine is more cheaper. So then why do you keep on doing this? This motivation, I hope we don't get, and we get the reward from the street. I think that is the, uh, that is the thing, because today, everything is possible. Like, do you want a good cotton? Do you want a good chemical? Do you want a good machine? Good supplier, everything is possible and very easy to approach, I think. And if you want to learn, everything is possible. Like, I'm managing the Carved in Blue blog. We've got kind of education things. When there's something new, we just put spotlight on it. If you spend time, you can learn. Is that possible? But we need to, I think, the next step, maybe I'm saying the last word in the beginning, I think we, we need to pass all of these homework, all these fruits in our hand to the end user for them to choose the right one with the right properties. That's what I think. So we need to have the right incentives in place. And I, I want to get more into what those barriers and opportunities are. But before we do that, um, Walden, I wanted to come to you and talk a little bit more about where you see the opportunities to drive this change. Because Unspun obviously is focusing on more on-demand manufacturing. You know, you started in 2019, if I've got my dates right. No, I've got my dates wrong. Right. Keep going. Uh, the question was, you can correct me, but the question was going to be, what made, you, what, what made you see this as the opportunity? Why is this the thing the industry needs? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's nice to be back. Um, I, I think with Denim, we've already talked a lot about the, the different innovations uh, that's happening, and it's av widely available. Uh, now I think it's, it's more thinking about systematic, thinking about where do you actually produce the, the right products in the right places, in the right quantities. And I think this notion of overproduction um, and, and having the, the right products in, in the right places for us is the is the real like genesis of why we started on spun um, because like we can use the best materials and we can use the best processes but if we're still overproducing and we're generating fast amount of quantities of products then we're, we're not doing the, the industry any good so that's why we you know invested in producing software that can create custom on demand and, and a 3d weaving technology that can turn yarns into final garments that so that we can actually produce close to where the consumers are and actually respond um, we think speed is is the is the new scale is, is essentially yeah and you know this conceptually sounds great but how hard is it in reality you know Adidas had a whole strategy pre-pandemic around speed factories and, and doing exactly this and they kind of abandoned it because they couldn't make it work you know, what is the unlock that might make it work? Yeah, I think a, a lot of uh, the topics around innovation is, is it happening at the right time? Uh, and I think Adidas is probably at a, ahead of its time when it, they produce a sweet factory. But if we look back at the past even three to five years, every 18 months we have like a black swan event, you know, with COVID, with the war, with now geopolitics. Really, I think we're getting to a point where things are happening at such an uncertain and unpredictable way that we have to do it in a way that's completely different from just mass, the more the better, is at least a bias thesis. No, I think that's such a fascinating point that, you know, even if you have the innovation there already, it's, is the world ready, are, are consumers ready? And I, th I think this is something we'll keep returning to. Um, but Ashi, I want to come to you and Sir, because we've heard a lot about recycling over the last you know, couple of hours. You know, with Cirque, what made you want to wade into this space now? Why is this an opportunity you saw here? Um, I think f first and foremost, our company's belief is that we have all the clothes we need to make all the clothes we'll ever need. So that's something that's always repeated at our company. Um, and I think that was really the thesis. And when we came to that, we were also very focused on like what is the biggest waste stream that no one is tackling um, or no one has the technology to tackle, which is blended textile waste streams. Um, so we s chose to specifically focus on separating co poly cotton blends. Um, and I would say predominantly from industrial waste, so waste from the supply chain, because we feel like that's already ready. It's already happening. Um, there are millions and millions of tons of poly cotton textile waste that is not being addressed. Um, and so being able to take that and separate and recover both fibers. Um, I think we just, we saw an opportunity, we saw that these resources already exist. Um, they're just not being tapped into. And I think there's also the reality of, I th 
we need to bring all these technologies together. We need to bring, you know, on-demand manufacturing, reduce consumption, make things better. But we also felt like the way the world is working right now, circularity, circularity really is the answer. Right. So individually, each of these solutions might sound simple, although not, I know none of them are. But actually, the complexity comes because they have to all come together. Um, I want to talk about the thing that I feel we've kind of been skirting around, but is sort of fundamental, which is money. Um, and Tundra, I wanted to come to you, you know, Lens, we've got two startups here, Lensing is a big company already. Um, but when you think about innovation and driving things forward, you know, how much does R&D cost? And within that, you know, what does it take to take, get a new innovation? and bring it to the market, even for a large corporation like Lenzig? Yeah, I mean, I want to tell you one <laughs> funny story initially. Like, uh, I was visiting a company for in, in the name of Lenzing, and I'm, I was talking about Refibra, and the initial part, they said, why you have 30% recycled pulp? Why don't you increase it? We said, yes, we can, this is possible, but uh, the pulp production uh, in, in, in a scalable way is, is not there yet. So we, we, we have some shortages sometimes. And because of that, we're going step by step in order to make a scalable innovation. Like, you can say everything, but eventually if you produce five tons per year, it doesn't mean anything to, to big companies. If you want to really make a change, you should make a step by step. And then uh, after half an hour later, we started to argue about the price of Refibra. So <laughs> and I said, if you increase it 30% to 50%, are you able to pay it? Like, no, but you should do it cheaper. But I mean, of course, price is a very vital issue on these topics. And then if there is not appropriate lending price in the industry, things become just only like a marketing story. Nothing about that. Like um, all those things, some of the things are really possible just to make them really happening. Like we should really think of this life on the street, like the inflation and everything, the end user. I'm still thinking from their angle, like they are spending less and less and less on their clothes. So if we just come up with the solution, we think the solution for the future, the double price of currently anything now. Like, how would you scale it up? Like, it, it is difficult. Of course, it's so, so crucial. So it's something like an affordable solution for everybody. That's what I'm thinking. And how are those conversations at the moment in particular? Price seems to be a very um, pointy subject at the moment. Shall I go and answer it? <laughs> of course, it's the main thing. Like, it, it, like, I'm from Turkey, and now Turkey is being kind of moving out of the industry. Turkey. Right, so it's all Bangladesh, all Pakistan. Like, and now uh, we're talking about sustainability for a pair of jeans, which is costing ten euro in retail. Like, I mean, there are some obstacles we need to think about altogether. That's why I'm saying we need to um, capture also the attention of the end user. Somehow, they should be at least acknowledged with the result of buying a ten euro jean. Like, how much can you claim on that? Question to you. Like, uh, a pair of jeans, ten euro. I don't know. Very good point. But, and I'm curious, Walden and Arshia, from your perspective, you know, startups typically not revenue generating, you're having to convince VCs to, to give you funding within this context. W what is that like and how does that play into the challenges of scaling up some of these solutions? Yeah, I think we've been talking about uh, like this space being slow. I think in general it's true if you compare to software where ven venture capital typically invest in. I think another big part is just the feedback cycle. Like, you know, if you start with a material, a fiber, a pulp, and like have to work through the entire value chain to create something that a designer would want to take on, it's like a very fairly long feedback cycle. Let's give it, what, three to four months? And startups don't have that many three to four months to, to, to burn through. So I think that's like the gist of why uh, this space is so hard. Um, Sorry, you, no, no, that's a really interesting point. And I wanted to draw on that comparison to software because Ashia, you came from the software space and it's obviously a very different type of product. And I hear this a lot from VCs where they move from software and they invest in, in fashion and they're like, oh, that's, that's, that's a physical product. <laughs> it's quite different. But how have you found that? Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen a change too. Um, I think in the beginning of, or I mean, sustainability has always happened, but I think there was definitely a, a surge. And I do think there was a moment where a lot of VCs had absolutely no idea what they were investing in. They absolutely had no idea what the runway required was and what that payback period would be. Um, I think it's it's changing a little bit. I think we see more and more educated investors coming to the table. Um, and for Cirque, what's been so pivotal is to have industrials 
investing. So we have, you know, Marabini, Young One, like people who are in this garment sector, um, Milliken, um, mills across the entire supply chain who have really been investing in our technology and what is so meaningful in that regard is to have people sitting on your cap table who know how long this takes to actually work. Um, so I'd say that's been, you know, revolutionary. I think a lot of startups are now seeing um, investment um, across the supply chain. The other aspect I would say is, you know, the the relationship we have with brands and back to back to cost. I think that has to look a little different. So, um, Cindy touched on commitments from brands. That's something that has been one of the hardest um, aspects to overcome. Everyone wants to do a pilot. Who wants to make a five-year commitment or a ten-year commitment um, to your fiber once it's at scale? I think that's what we really need. Um, and sometimes in that conversation, you're talking about investment, you're talking about upfront payments, you will see the reward as a brand down the line, but brands really aren't used to thinking like that at the moment. Why do you think that is? For so many brands who've made yeah. commitments to reduce their impact, they need to start doing this kind of stuff. They need to talk, stop making bets on where they think they're gonna be able to do that. Yeah. Why do you think they're still unwilling to commit to longer term? Uh, personally, I don't think I don't think the system is built to reward that behavior from a brand at the moment. Um, I think brands still are thinking very much on a seasonal cycle. Um, there's a big disconnect between the managers of product teams who are looking at their PNL and the people sitting in the investment arm. There's not necessarily a reward for having losses in the first five years and then in the sixth year recouping those losses. I don't think there is a connection between those teams. <laughs> Um, you'll see, I mean, across innovators, you'll see investment from the investment arm of a brand, and that does not mean they're going to launch something. It is completely separate. So I think those rewards don't really necessarily pass on to product teams. Um, and until, I mean, I think until that gap is closed, it's going to be really hard to have this conversation. Um, yeah. I think that's really interesting because it sort of ties into the point Tundra started with around, you know, do consumers care? Are they talking to the people on the product side at brands? Is that then all connecting the dots? And Tundra, I'm curious because you raised this. What do you think it's going to take to make people care, to connect all these dots? I think like reality, like the climate change, for instance, it's happening. Like we're today <laughs> 25 degrees outside. So this is happening. I mean, if, if there is an interest, I think if we talk, if we, if we, if we just not to all of us aim to give just advertisements of our goods, but then rather just try to give some educational stuff to them, just create some awareness on them. I don't, maybe it's not something easy, but we should aim for that as well. Like I think as an industry, we came, this transformation you were talking about initially, is happened in a certain amount, and now we need a reward, like so that to carry on, because it's not uh, just a hobby job, <laughs> this is something. You know, what are those conversations like with brands? We've talked a little bit about pricing, but when you talk to them about, hey, you're using, you know, refibra or whichever of the lensing fibers it is, you know, this is how we want you to talk about it. What's that like? Are you finding companies see this as exciting, something they think consumers will be excited about, something they're willing to start? You know, it making depends, a selling point. Yeah, it depends on the location we're talking about. Like North Europe, of course, there's more attention, more intention. Like where the second hand and all these retail, rebuy, resale, all these things are happening. So there, there's more awareness. Whereas other countries is not the same. So of course, brands are positioning themselves according to where they operate in. And in the brands area, some there are different approaches. Some sometimes it just look like a commercialist, like. If the price is in or out, so if they're out, you're out. Some people say, no, okay, I can just start like a pilot project. I can just, known as, as a pioneer on that, but when it comes to real reality, it's like, the, for instance, today, 1% of, today I'm saying all the facts, which, is, which are not funny, sorry. Today, the recycling volume still 1%. So we're talking for five years about scalable circularity or you know like um, some of the brands are just taking this uh, posh words and trying to engage with that but when it comes to real stuff like some scale they're having issues they're also in in a limited area because the the consumer doesn't really 
pay attention, pay more for this because, I mean, like for instance, Modal Indigo, as we have seen, like there is an innovation that you add the indigo from the birth of the fiber, which you don't need to dye it again. There are a huge amount of um, storation from the good, from the chemicals and then all the other things. But how much it's happening because it's an expensive fiber is limited always. I also thought that was such an interesting point that that's it, the dope dye makes it too blue. But too blue to who? Like ha who's made it desirable to have bleached denim? You know, why can't we make it desirable to have a deeper hue of blue because it's a sign that it's been dyed in a more sustainable way? That, that which is a really fascinating point. You know, well, Nasha, I'm, I'm curious how you found this conversation. You know, talking to brands about how you want them to communicate what you're doing, which you know will be new to many consumers, and in particularly in the context of the last sort of two years where the industry's really faced a lot of criticism for greenwashing and communicating things in a way that wasn't you know, quite 100% accurate. Um, have you found brands are more reluctant to talk about their work or they're still eager? I, you know, Walden, I'm gonna go to you first. Yeah, I think it's very hard to preach the the fashion industry into creating something that's better. Like it, it has to be, it has to be better from the creative director's point of view. We've seen conversations just like accelerate and speed up whenever we can tap into the creative director's mind. Even get getting like that 15, 20 minute attention, it goes a, a long way. And also, you know, with with mainstream media and what we focus on when fashion week happen and like whether sustainability is, is a topic or, or, or whether something else becomes the, the the main topic of interest is it's also you know that's the topic of conversation right um and so a lot of time that that gets missed in in the in the vo in, in all the noise that's generated from from fashion right so it's just what's hot what's exciting and you know, Asha, we were just talking about um fashion week and what was that like because in new york it came right before climate week um this well, every year, and fashion was not very present. But so, and, but you guys just were yeah. awarded the Earthshot, or not, sorry, finalist for the Earthshot yeah. Prize. Yeah, um, which has been an amazing journey for us. Um, I would say, by and large, I think maybe we've been really lucky. I think brands do want to, they do want to tell the story correctly. I think what is difficult is there is a gap between what consumers actually already know about their product and then introducing a new concept. So, when you start to talk about, okay, yes, this is using recycled textile waste, by the way, that can't be recycled. That's even a new fact for most people right now. So there is this need to simplify, but also be accurate. So we've seen, I think, brands really, really want to, to tell that story correctly, but they're not experts, and we do very much handhold and, and make sure that um, that messaging is coming across clear. But what I would say is, probably more of a challenge is what happens after pilot. Like, I personally think launches are fun, first capsules are fun. The, the challenge is what happens next? What happens when it's not a marketing story? Does it still sell for that higher price point? Um, and, you know, my background's in, I came from the blockchain world and there, there was this moment where everyone wanted to talk about it and there was a moment where no one wanted to talk about it. And the, the, the innovations that kept going were ones where it wasn't on the label, it wasn't on the hang tag. It was still being bought, but it was behind the scenes. And I think when we get to that point where you can have recycled content, but it's not sitting on the hang tag and people are still buying because it's so subtle, but it is making that difference, I think that's when sustainability will actually be a, you know, a behavior. Also, hot take, I think blockchain is one of the most like, biggest marketing coups of the last 15 years because making something so <laughs> boring, so sexy, yeah. um, was incredible. Um, sorry, Walden, you were going to jump in. No, no, I think, I think definitely there's a, a mentality with, with brands when you launch a pilot that like, you, you kind of carve out that piece and like, nobody wants to touch that piece. But as a startup, you know, venture back startup, what you want to do is like build once and, and you sell multiple times like that, that gives you the scal scalability. And that's typically like missing in our space because there, like, there is a bit of like, if that has been done, that story has been told, I don't want to tell that story. Yeah, what's the next new thing? Uh, we have talked a lot about obstacles and challenges. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what the unlocks could be 
to help us move beyond this moment? And, you know, Tunja, I'm going to start with you. Are there things that you see happening that makes you think we could be moving beyond where we are right now? For sure. Like, at least we start to talk about all of these things now. There is an acknowledge. Like, um, we are kind of uh, understanding the facts. Like, all these numbers, LCAs, like environmental impacts and everything, recycling, the waste we created. So, five years ago, not many people were aware of that. There are certain people, but not the waste community I'm talking about. So, of course, like, we cannot find the right thing before we make a mistake. So, we're kind of sometimes making circles, sometimes proceeding. But I think if we're going somewhere, at least we know what's, what's happening. So, we're all... To me, everybody's talking about this. Now departments are uh, already settled in the brands, like a CSR, at least talk about or defend themselves for certain things. <laughs> like, this is happening already. So we cannot move forward before we, we, we talk about all of these things. And um, there are, like, benchmarks are happening. Like, which one is better, which one is worse, which is evil. Some, that, that's all these things are subjective. Like, for instance, just one example. Um, it was uh, 10 years ago, a well-known well -known brand made an inquiry in their shop. Once these stretches, these super stretches are invented, they asked the ladies who are wearing skinny jeans, why do you wash your jeans? Why do you wash your jeans? Why oft how often and why? And they were expecting, of course, the response like, they're dirty. But the response was, they're uh, losing the shape. And eventually, innovation came up with the recovery with polyester. Yes, it is polyester. Okay, which, which one you want to call it? But if you create a, the, the, the product in a genius way, smart way, and companies like Sir can recycle those components, we can also consume water because we don't wash it every, every now and then. So I think benchmarks are happening, like Transformers Foundation is now helping on this, just trying to create like uh, material uh, standards, so that I think there are many things going on because we are in the middle of discussion. We should, maybe very late, but at least we're proceeding in a way. Thank you. That's such an interesting point that sort of where the conversation is and how important it is to have that and start to understand the data piece and the benchmarks, which, you know, it's amazing that we've got to this point and that is still happening. That baseline still needs to be set even as innovation is moving before, uh, ahead of it. Um, you know, and Ashia, I'm curious from your perspective, you know, coming from the software industry into the apparel industry, what do you see changing here? Um, I mean, I think where, I think there's two really positive changes. I would say collaborations and regulation. Um, specifically for denim, what I think makes it such a promising space is that it is largely vertically integrated. Um, as someone who is just, we're just really innovating on the fiber side, generally we don't have a say into what happens after we provide fiber. And designing for circularity usually happens at like the remainder 90%. So I think, you know, the, the reason denim is so exciting for Cirque, and um, this is our first denim, so we're really excited about it, is we were able to bring together technologies in this. So dissolvable threads, you know, laser finishing, recycled water, um, so that we can actually start to understand how we can take it back and recycle it again. And that's really done I think specifically in denim because there is a lot of vertical integration and an opportunity to bring together technologies like you know on-demand manufacturing, um, the dye chemistries that are super innovative, um, and bring those into one garment and really push circularity forward. Um, and then the other aspect is of course regulation. Um, I think we see a lot of amazing regulation coming in the EU that's going to be a very clear financial reason for brands to change um, and also start to, I think, educate the public generally on this issue and really incentivize innovators to, um, you know, to continue building. I want to move, uh, talk more about regulation briefly because I know we're running short, but just Walden, curious if you have anything to add to that. I, I think we, we need to take a step back. Like I think, what, three years ago, the, the word sustainability has a, so much weight almost. But now like we kind of reframe it as, as climate. Obviously, they're not the same, but climate is cool. And, you know, except if you're certain, within certain parts of the US, it's, it's, pretty, it's a u pretty unifying Raleigh call for, for action. Um, and then I think beyond that, we're, we're seeing you know automation uh, with with the capability to to reduce costs, where we can potentially launch at cost parity, even without the steep ramp up curve that a lot of the the materials innovations uh, that we've seen, or even help with the materials innovations launch to market with when even they have small quantities. 
I think that that's a really interesting point and also the point about how we now think about sustainability as meaning climate because on this panel we haven't really talked at all about the social impact and obviously a lot of this innovation will have a big social impact and that does need to be part of the conversation I say with one minute left so we're not going to get into that in detail but there's plenty of other things to talk about and you know I think definitely something that people can talk about over lunch um, but maybe just to leave everyone with a final thought if each of you could just sort of say what you think in the next 12 months is there something you think could meaningfully move the needle near term I think there's this notion that brands are really scared of commitments. And I think from the other side of the table, I can share the perspective that having seen a lot of the innovators, like you actually see the entire organization pivot towards some of the early commitments from brands. And like as a brand, you actually have very meaningful, significant advantage if you can actually, you know, commit to a certain number of years if they hit certain requir standard requirements. Um, and I think that's something that's probably a misperspective um, from like brand approaching these conversations. So it's that, that path to scale, Ash, Ashia. Um, yeah, I would say, I would say similarly, um, I think there is going to be this marriage of the regulation. I mean, specifically in circularity with, um, you know, banning landfilling of textiles that matching up with this pivotal moment where bands have been, brands have been teetering, like, should we commit? Should we, should we make that big commitment? Should we not? And I think there is going to be this moment where, you know, some brands will start that commitment and we already see it happening and it will, I think, kind of spur a bit of a tidal wave of, of commitments. So I think we're in a, f a first mover place and we're going to get to a lot of the, you know, early and later adoption very soon. Um, or at least that's, that's oh, the tidal hope. wave of commitments. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Tanjoy, what's your thing? Yeah, I think um, in the greenwashing area, there are many things happened. Like they are not that, uh, I mean, making claim is not easy anymore. So everybody's not green obviously anymore uh, this is uh, this is great and this extended product responsibility part still needs many steps like it's not easy to collect all these waste and recycle them it's not just like this so it's going to take take some more time and on the other hand um, brands are more aware of all these happening and they're also preparing themselves but on the other hand there are the topics in the EU legislation, from my end, I'm thinking, all these uh, more attention to durability, et cetera, et cetera. So these things are a bit evolving because on the table, there's not only cotton industry, there's also polyester industry, other industries. So some of the topics will evolve, I think, in the next 10, 12 months. But I think in the greenwashing area, there will be some nice results, like we can see how people are doing the, their things, claims not going to be that easy. And we will hear, I think, a lot more investment on the, uh, the back-end area where for this waste management issue. That's what I'm hearing and I'm hoping to hear more so that we can at least close the loop and come up with some solutions. That's what I'm thinking. We are unfortunately at time. Obviously, there's so much more we could talk about, but thank you all for sharing this top level. <laughs>
tons of CO2. Uh, carbon black is basically everywhere. Everything that you see that is black, from your bag to the chairs and everything, contains that pigment to give that color. Uh, so we're really on a mission to replace the carbon black in inks, coatings, paints, and uh, generally speaking, in plastics, outside, everything outside of tire, and to really make a positive impact into into the space. My background is in, uh, uh, actually, I'm super flattered to be here, like uh, to be among uh, like, uh, all of these uh, denim geeks. Uh, actually, I come from a very different space. I worked a lot in technology, always with early stage startups, but in 2018, I decided to move uh, towards like the fashion industry, but really at the intersection of sustainability technology and how these two, especially technology, can help a fashion be more sustainable. I worked with Fashion for Good, with the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, a couple of the startups uh, that are here, and uh, I joined Nature Coatings as employee number two back in, uh, back in February. I'm based here in Europe, in Milan, and it uh, turns out to be like a really great space, Italy, when it comes to, to the supply chain, where we also really work uh, by selling our pigment. Brilliant, thank you. Justin? Um, I think everyone could hear that though, So, um, but Hue, we're based in Berkeley, California, and we're a cleaner color company. Um, we use biotechnology um, to create um, our first commercial product, which is Indigo, uh, for cleaner denim, but our platform technology is really to culture nature's rainbow. So that's a play on words intentionally because we are using um, biosynthesis fermentation to scale up our um, microbes that are trained to make color, um, and then using um, fermentation and uh, a distilling process to create a, a bio match to what is the, the current color um, indigo or any color that we're, we're making in the future. And previous to this, I was um, at another company in the auxiliary and chemical finishing space called Evolved by Nature, um, focused mainly on leather and textile. And then um, prior to that, I spent um, half of my career at Swarovski Professional in the B2B component space, selling loose crystal components and working with designers and collaborations. Okay, so we have some very serious heavy hitters on this stage right now who have been doing this a very long time. So I, wanna, I was going to ask you both about some of the challenges and sort of the issues with dyes in the textile space, particularly denim. I don't think this room will be particularly shocked to find out that it is uh, a very, very um, damaging aspect of the denim industry. However, I actually now want to ask a different question first, which is the biotech space. How does this interact now with the textile space? We've been hearing a lot about how the fashion industry is evolving, slowly embracing new technology. What's your experience been, uh, Laura? Well, it's been super interesting for us in the past couple of months, especially, like uh, really specifically also on uh, the denim space. There's a huge demand for bio-based uh, bio materials and bio-based dyes. Uh, so that's really, really where, uh, where it comes down for us. Uh, we interact with both sides, like uh, both with brands and both with, and, uh, with the textile or denim meals. Uh, but where we see really the push is on uh, the supply chain and like really working with the textile and denim meals that are looking for solutions that are less uh, harmful for the environment and also, and also for people. So, the, the bio-based uh, uh, aspect for us is super, super important, and that's what we're asked for. But of course, uh, there's uh, the aspect of the formulation to be bio-based, but also the demand that the performance be either the same or even better. So that's really what it comes to. It's, it's kind of like a fine balance between the two, and that's what we're seeing the most, especially um, just over the summer after we launched the Will Levi's. Uh. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think... The, the beautiful thing about biotech, and I, of course, am a bit biased, uh, but we can tackle these performance issues, which I think a lot of consumers are frustrated about because they don't, a lot of early bio-based solutions do not hold up in terms of performance. Justin, how have you seen that? I mean, you've got even more on the tech side of biotech. How is this working from your experience? Yeah, I think one of the things that's really interesting about Hue is that the approach has been very engineer driven, but also design thinking driven. So um, one of the key and critical points about being a bioidentical match to synthetic or, or plant-based indigo, so the molecular structure is exactly the same. When you look at Hue under a microscope, it is exactly the same. Um, I've done about four trials. I just started with a company in June, so we've been on the road going to various geographies. Um, and the, the main feedback is, you know, it's a one-to-one drop-in replacement. And I think that that's 
um, something interesting to distinguish because I've worked for a previous company where you're really more of an alternative. So even though we all like to use that word drop in as it is a selling tool, and in many cases, it is drop in, but you may need to change temperature. You may need to add in this auxiliary to keep the hand or keep the color intensity. Um, with our product, what we did was we focused on that from the start. So our head of product who comes from VF Corp, he's not letting it get past his, you know, his um, stage gates of what this actually needs to be in order to be a scale-up product. Um, and I think that that's something that is really critical in making something that's commercial and that you can actually buy and, and um, scale up as some of the other panelists were talking about too. I also want to come to you to talk a little bit more about Indigo specifically because I know that's, as you know, as you say, culture of the rainbow, but why did you start with Indigo? Well, quick poll, but I think I already know who's wearing jeans today. I mean, this would be an easy one. more jeans in their closet, <laughs> right? So um, we won't get into the consumerism behind it, but I think a lot of people are talking about thrifted or upcycled, so that's great. But um, the denim industry is a great kind of case study to start with. So our co-founder, Tammy, Dr. Tammy Sue, she was studying the indigo plant to see how nature makes color. And it just so happened that, you know, when she paired up with our CEO, um, Michelle Zhu, they're not related, it's two different spellings, but two powerful female co-founders out of the Silicon Valley area. So they, um, you know, they looked at the denim industry, two billion pairs, or more produced every single year, about 70,000 to 80,000 metric tons of mainly synthetic fossil fuel derived indigo. So that was the, the problem to start the company. And the last thing I'll say about that is um, such an appreciation for business development or commercial when you can be really focused and talk, because these are all conversations that, you know, I myself, a team of one, am having to have with the mills, the brands, all the manufacturing supply chain partners, all the, the voices that are a part of making that decision. And so it's really great to focus on one color that happens to be part of, or it is its own industry. Yeah, I think that's kind of amazing. And I was actually just standing in the back of the room looking at everyone here going, oh my God, everyone is wearing blue somewhere, uh, whether it's jeans or jackets or shirts or, I mean, and the dyes that you're making, I'm assuming can go into a lot of different textiles. I think, in, well, definitely on the, in terms of the platform, there's different dye classes that we're focused on, um, but the indigo is such a unique um, and intrinsic part of denim. Um, I think as you heard in, in Mohsen's um, very quick you know, overview, like Denim 101, um, just based on the, the way that it crystallizes and, and allows for the rope dyeing effect um, or the ring dyeing effect um, on the rope, it's, um, it is unique to, to denim, I would say. But yes, we've used it in garment dyeing and other, um, other methods as well. But other dye classes in the future for Hue will be um, set for, you know, right now it's natural fibers, but we're also looking at other types of cellulosics and um, synthetics, recycled synthetics. Fantastic. Laura, I want to come to you now because I know that you've been doing a lot of work with big brands such as Levi's. How has that experience been for you kind of, you know, are there any kind of tips and tricks that you can, or words of caution, because working with the big brands, as we've heard several times today, is not so easy. So how did that go for you? It was interesting. We were just talking about it earlier. So, well, Levi's is the first big brand that we worked with. And, uh, you know, I have to say the conversation went on for, for a few years. Eh? So absolutely great partner. There's an opportunity there for scalability, for marketing and communication, but most importantly, really for impact that is massive. However, you have to deal with a big corporation made of many different teams that very often are not even talking to each other, which is the big problem that every single company would have. So speaking to the sustainability team, my stay with the sustainability team and not get to the marketing team or the legal team. We also realize that there is a bunch of like uh, legal stuff involved into communicating a partnership or taking it to market that we had no idea. One of those is also the fear of greenwashing because communicating too much innovation into garments that are part of a capsule collection can in a way reflect negatively on the rest. So it's just very, very difficult for brands. So like from really a marketing perspective and commercial perspective, follow like the, the big brand, start the conversation, engage with them for as long as it takes, three, four years, or sometimes five years, but also go for the quick wins. Because I think that that's really where the power of being able to show what's possible with your product. 
I'm wearing this because when I talk about pigment, and I love the fact that you use color a lot, and there's another company that doesn't talk about pigment, but just very much about color. People lose attention after two seconds. Like, and nobody cares about pigment. Well, I wouldn't say cares, but like nobody thinks about pigment. But, and this happens also on a brand level. So being able to show like what's possible to do with the pigment or with the color, is just like super important. So the small brands are definitely that quick win. And then one can keep having the conversation with the big brands for as long as it takes. Again, and the potential is, I think that there are pros and cons on both, but yeah, it's interesting to work with big brands. I mean, I, I really like what you've just said, though, about taking the, the smaller wins, working with smaller brands who maybe they don't have the same reach or distribution, but it almost builds your portfolio of, and we did this, and we did this, and we did this, we did this, see big brand. We told you we could deliver. There's also a little bit of that, which, and I also want to highlight something else that you just said, which is that the marketing aspect of this, which is, is critical, obviously, to communicate with consumers, but if the brands, and this is something we talked about in our, our call before this panel, if the brands say, ah, this you know, denim is made with the world's most sustainable pigments and dyes and all these things, what does it say about the rest of the products that they make? So that puts brands in a huge bind. How do you navigate that? I don't know yet. <laughs> because, uh, Fair. We're, it's, I never thought, so my experience is in B2B. I worked for a long time in technology and I was like, okay, marketing is important, but it's more like uh, sales. You know, you have to support sales. Then I got to this job and I was like, uh, marketing is everything. I'm doing something and that actually is really important. Because uh, I think it's uh, literally they're helping them to tell a story that doesn't really compromise the rest of the collection. So when we talk to brands about, you know, how to communicate Bio Black TX, uh, it's never really about, unfortunately, although this is a conversation that I would love to have and really talk about the toxic dyes. We're not going to go there. There's one brand. I don't know if they're here. Volbuck. No, it's a UK based brand and it's one of the few brands that have really nailed They're talking about the problem with carbon black and, uh, you know, all how dirty the color black is. We're not going to get that like very often, but I think the circularity story for us is super important. So the input that we use for the pigment is wood waste and it's wood waste that is pre-consumer and industrial. So it means that we go to the lumber papers and like furniture industry and we take those parts of like the wood waste that can really be used for anything else, such as like the little branches and the bark. It's FSC certified. It means that it's traceable and we know that it's taken from sustainably managed and certified sources. So that story of circularity and talk about uh, where that comes from and because otherwise the wood waste would be left on the side of the road to rot or even worse to burn and like uh, emit tons of CO2, we recapture that back into the pigment. So that's one way that we can help them communicate it. Uh, but yeah, I think ideally we would really want to talk about uh, how bad the carbon black is. But uh, yeah, we'll get there. It's, it's a tough one. It's a really tough uh, sort of line to walk between alienating your partners and also saying, hey, but you're still not doing a very good job because the, what you're using right now is, is very toxic. Um, Justin, I want to talk now about manufacturing because in the symbio space, the synthetic biology space, engineering biology space, for those who are not familiar, I'm gonna, this is the short version of that because I could just talk all day about that. Um, you have a, a more of a unique challenge, I think, when it comes to scale up. Microbes are notoriously, yeah, they have their own little ways of doing things and they don't always agree with, I, I don't really wanna scale, I'm, I'm tired, it's too much. How do you manage your technology, which is very powerful, with the demands of brands and scale that you need to reach to impact all of the clothes that we're wearing here today? I definitely should have brought my VP of manufacturing to, to answer this question. No, no, but we talk, the good thing is I think at Hue it's a small company, we're only 16 people, so we talk a lot. And um, what we've, you know, commercial is informing just as much as manufacturing is also talking, you know, up and out about, you know, what are some of the things that they're trying to do. And from my perspective, what I've observed is keeping that process simple, keeping um, the the media that we're feeding. So we literally are taking microbes that, that are coming from Hue, we're training them to convert sugar to dye. So we're looking, that'll, that enabled us to do a lot of different things in terms of future feedstock, looking at 
uh, renewable, circular, as well as recycled um, for some of our other die class um, R&D developments. But um, keeping, I think, the process simple and also um, as we start to scale, I mean, I think it's a, a textbook, um, you know, academic way of looking at like startup to, to scaling, but thinking big now. So looking at the geographies that we need to be in, thinking about, you know, larger distribution contracts now, not necessarily, and this is something that Laura had brought up when we were talking on our, our pre-call. So I think it's just thinking big um, as we're small now to, to start that scaling process. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I'm not quite sure how much time we have, but I think there could be a moment here to ask some, get some questions from the audience as well. I want to bring you guys into this. If anyone has any questions, please let me know. Um, so I want to know though about next steps because, you know, obviously this is, you guys have started to make partnerships, starting to scale, but there's a huge way to go or a very long way to go. So what do the next 12 months look like? Laura, I want to come to you first. Yeah, we definitely want to go into other industries. Uh, the application for the pigment can, uh, can go beyond the textile industry, which is the first space that, that we went into. Uh, Jane, the founder, had 20 years of experience in the pigment and dyes industry. Uh, she founded the first dye house in the US using exclusively insect-based and plant-based dyes. So that's where her bank background is. And uh, that's how almost like organically we moved into the fashion industry. But the applications are... Um, also in automotive, exterior car paint, uh, and uh, paints in general and coatings. Uh, our product has low VOCs, and uh, for those of you familiar with it, it's that kind of the smell that gets you high a little bit, like when you start painting. Well, that's quite toxic. So our product has very low amount, uh, so the applications are really endless from, from this perspective. So that's really where we want to go. Fashion industry is great. Unfortunately, the sales cycle is very, very long. We need to be more patient and we need to sell the product. So we want to be also in spaces that where we can make an impact, but also make uh, some money right away, I guess. <laughs> we need that. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And are you venture backed as well? Yeah, we just closed the investment. We uh, sit round led by Regeneration VC, the 22 fund. Portfolio, Safer Made, and Leonardo DiCaprio. And previously, we got a bit of funding from Fashion for Good, Heartland, and Apex Black, a part of PDS. So that has definitely helped as well, like in terms of setting up our own manufacturing equipment and moving forward. I mean, I'm just really impressed that all that you have done in a short amount of time with a very, very small team. It intimidates me how much work you've done in a short amount of time. Um, Justin, what is coming up? Again, another really small, powerful team. What's coming up the next 12 months? Yeah, so we have some exciting um, uh, news that will come out next week. So we're going to be debuting, debuting some uh, finished fabrics um, with mill partners um, at Kingpins. So that's kind of leading up to, to that. So stay tuned for that. Um, we wanted to, there was a lot of good brand interest and good brand work being done um, before I stepped into the commercial role at Hue. We wanted to round that off with some going back into the supply chain partners um, on the mill side because there's, I mean, you can see downstairs um, really innovative partners that are doing some incredible, like making all of the, the magic happening, bringing all of the partners together on the supplier side with the fibers, with the different technologies, with the chemical finishing. So all of that doesn't happen at the brand level. That happens with uh, an R&D manufacturing partner. Um, I'm really enthused by the space because I just meet so many people from around the world, usually the next generation stepping into the business. A lot of it's family, you know, business passed down or very um, optimistic entrepreneurial spirit um, of the new management coming in. And I think that there's such an opportunity because we're hearing, you know, how do we make the change? How do we make it happen faster? How do we get people to understand? I really think the people that are making um, are our biggest leveraging point in getting brands to convert because they're the ones doing the testing. They're the ones that are proving it, right, right with their process and everything. So it's really exciting. I can't say exactly which partner um, in particular that I'm thinking of, but um, they're definitely downstairs in Mills. So check, check out the thing and, and do some guessing. We can talk later. Well, I am personally very excited to know who this is when it becomes public. Do call. Um, one thing though that you just mentioned is is these, these collaborative opportunities. And, and I think... You're both, both of your companies are incredible examples of this. Because you're in this pigments and dye space, I think you're more modular than a lot of other um, a 
aspects of the denim industry. I mean, you don't have to have huge fields. You're not growing indigo, and you're certainly not going through massive petrochemical plants. So I just want to highlight the opportunity possibly for this room um, that we can start stacking technologies a lot more easily than incumbent industries. Uh, I mean, you're obviously both looking at you know where you can build, where your partners will be. And I wonder, do you see more opportunities or different opportunities than I think have been previously understood in this space? Laura, do you want to go for it? Can I pick on you? Yeah, no, so I think 100% that when it comes to, to that, that's something that we learned actually in, uh, if that's where your question was going to go, that's something that we learned in the, the past couple of weeks, so bundling up innovation and actually showing what's possible to brands is game changer. And that's really what we're seeing. We're, we're a small team, like uh, 16 is big for us, you know? It's, uh, <laughs> we're, we're three people and uh, like we're so focused on our product that, that sometimes we forget that, that actually look, not everyone has the right tools, especially in brands, to understand what we're selling and to help them really figure out like what the different applications are. Uh, so I think like uh, talking about collaboration, which is actually what we hear a lot like on the big stages, right? The collaboration between brands, but then where are the suppliers, where are the innovators? Probably something that we should look at is uh, what does collaboration look like even uh, among innovators uh, to really help each other. That's a really good observation, you know, that you made. In terms of presenting one solution uh, that it's much easier to plug into the, their existing processes and systems. Uh, no, I really like that. I mean, instead of saying, I have a solution over here, and I have a solution over here, and I have a solution way over here, you know, all, everyone comes together and says, we collectively have a solution. Here it is, packaged up. Here, nice big brand. There you go. And to, to make the barrier for entry easier for them, because then we can rely on their scale and supply um, and distribution. Um, Justin, do you want to add any thoughts to this? I think we are in our last minute. <laughs> yeah, I think, minute. Um, and it's not to end on a down point. I think... Uh, all of that, yes, yes, yes. I think we just have to be mindful that we're not like building the the Ferrari of of cost or of uh, that it's you know it's completely feasible. So I think everything that you just said, um, Laura, and and what you added, Fiona, is completely correct, and we have to do more of it. Um, and I think it goes back to like what is the story that we're trying to tell? There's a lot of science and a lot of you know like hard to digest things, but I think um, it comes down to what is this fabric or what is this gene or what is this whatever we're building um, trying to say. And so I think that that is part of that stacking mentality. Yeah, because I think at the end of the day, the consumer does not care necessarily about the innovation we put into it at the molecular level. They just want to know it's better for the planet and that they can afford it. Um, so there's a lot of work that we have to do behind the scenes to make that consumer journey easy. Laura, Justin, you're both amazing. I'm really excited about your work. Thank you so much. Thank you, panelists. Um, so that marks the end of our event. I want to say a huge thank you to all of our incredible speakers today. And also thank you to each and every one of you in the audience for showing up. Um, we're so humbled to be part of such a collaborative uh, community. And also just want to give a special shout out to my team at the Mills Fabrica for pulling off this event. Thank you.